to set everything up. Um, whilst, before we just get to the formal part of the meeting, um, it's lovely to see everybody and I hope everybody's well. Um, for people who aren't used to the council chamber and speaking, um, I know it can be a bit daunting. The way it works is so that we don't all shout at each other, only one person can use the mic at once. So in front of you is like a big, the biggest red button um, is what you need to press to get the mic on. And obviously, if somebody else has got it on, you can't speak. So um, when we get to the point of questions and any comments that people want to make, if you want to raise your hand, um, I will then switch off my mic and then you just press the big red button, you'll be able to speak. Um, and it really isn't as formal as it sounds. So I hope that's okay with everybody. So as we have a number of people who are substituting for people and also our presenters here, um, I thought it would just be nice to everyone just quickly to say uh, who they are and their organisation. So I'm Councillor Rachel Blake. I'm Cabinet Member for Children's Social Care Equalities and Communities at Doncaster Council, and I'm Chair of the Board. Should we go that way, Rupert? Hi, Rupert Suckling, Director of Public Health here in the Council. I'm Dave Richmond, I'm Chief Edgar Cat and Ledger. Hi, Jackie Pedersen, Accountable Officer, Doncaster CCG. Morning, Richard Parker, Chief Executive, uh, Doncaster Bassett Law Teaching Hospitals. Hi, I'm Christina Harrison um, from Rotherham, Doncaster and South Umber, uh, NHS Trust, and I'm representing Catherine Singh. Uh, Alan Wiltshire, Head of Policy Intelligence at the Council. Andrea Robinson, Portfolio Holder for Adult Social Care. Becca Wilshire, uh, Director of Children's Social Care in Doncaster's Children's Services Trust. Lee Golds, Assistant Director for Children's Services at the Council. Phil Holmes, Director of Adults Health and Wellbeing at the Council. Councillor Sarah Smith, uh, Chair of Health and Adult Social Care Scrutiny. Hi, it's Councillor Lynch Ball, um, Cabinet Member for Public Health, Leisure, Culture and Planning. Um, I'm Victoria Rives and I work at Heritage Doncaster. <laughs> Good morning, um, Lucy Roberts Shaw. I'm Assistant Director at Darts, Doncaster Community Arts, and I sit on the Health and Wellbeing Board to represent the Health and Social Care Forum. Carolyn Ogle, Associate Director for Primary Care and Commissioning at Doncaster CCG, visiting today. Uh, morning, I'm Anthony Fitzgerald. I'm Director of Strategy and Delivery at Doncaster CCG. Uh, Jonathan Goodrum, Senior Governance Officer at the Council. Thank you, everybody. I do like watching people when they do that, because it's like, what order do I go in? And nobody wants to speak when they shouldn't. So um, thank you for that. I think we ha are expecting a couple more people that have been delayed. I've just seen Amber nip off, so hopefully she's collecting them. So we have received apologies oh, from um, Chief Superintendent Mel Palin, Dr David Crichton from the CCG, Steve Shaw from Health Watch. Rihanna Nelson, but we have Lee representing from DMBC, Catherine Singh, but we have the other Catherine covering, and Ellie Honeyball from South Yorkshire Fire and Rescue, and uh, Cynthia Ransom as well has just uh, sent her apologies. Do we have any other apologies that we need to note? Okay, welcome. Um, I'll just wait till people get seated. Uh, please come and sit in the meeting. Just find a, micro a desk with a microphone on. <coughs> just wait for everybody to come in, please do come in. Oh, come and sit in the meeting, Dean. That 
that's all right. Welcome the people that have just come in. I've just been explaining, if you've not been in the council chamber, how the microphones work. Um, to keep us all in order in the chamber, we all can only speak at once. So if you do want to speak, you have to pr press the big red button um, and that puts your mic on. So could I just add, we've just done introductions. So if the people that have just come in would mind introducing themselves. Uh, should we start with you, Kath? Kath Witherington, Voluntary Action, Doncaster. Dr. Dean Eggett, local GP and uh, LMC Chief Executive Officer. Lovely. So welcome, everybody. Great to see such a good attendance. Uh, as always, we've got a very packed agenda. So if you are presenting and you've been allocated an amount of time, please um, uh, present for probably half of that time to allow for lots of questions, uh, because we always have lots of questions that people want to to ask, which is good. I do have to read out the next bit because um, we have to do that. So, all attendees will be required to maintain social distancing rules and wear a mask unless medically exempt whilst moving around the civic chamber and civic building. Masks can be removed once seated. There are hand sanitizers located outside the entrance and inside the chamber meeting room for use by attendees. We are not expecting a fire practice today. If the alarm sounds, please leave the building by way of the fire exit through the doors at the rear of the chamber, which are over there. When you have left the chamber, proceed down the stairway and exit through the emergency exit on the ground floor. If there is anybody with mobility issues, please wait in the refuge area at the top of the stairs where the emergency evacuation lift is located and use the intercom situated to the left-hand side of the lift doors to call for assistance. The designated assembly point is the public square in front of CAST beyond the fountain, which is that way. I would like to inform any members of the public and press that today's meeting will be audio-visually recorded. By entering the council chamber, you accept that you will re be recorded and your image is retained and broadcast by the council on its website and on YouTube. If anyone intends to record or film any part of today's meeting, please ensure that this does not disturb the conduct of the meeting and you only focus on recording those people participating. As we know, it's the 11th of November today, um, our Remembrance Day. So when we get to 11 o'clock, I will be stopping the meeting and asking you to observe two minutes silence along with the rest of the country. Um, Jonathan is primed to make sure that we do that at the right time. I will uh, make sure that the people who are presenting at that time know we will be stopped as well. So that's item one, welcome introductions. On to item two, chair's announcements. Um, just to remind members of the board that probably about six or seven months ago now, we um, discussed the carers charter and there was agreement that we would sign up to the charter as a health and wellbeing board and partner agencies. So one, when the meeting finishes, um, there will be a group photograph and signing of the carers charter in here. So could I please ask that you all stay. In terms of timing of the meeting, I think everybody hopefully has in their diaries two and a half hours. If we do get finished earlier, then we'll obviously do the, the charter signing straight away. Okay, so that's my announcements. Item three is exclusion of the press and public, and there are no items on today's agenda where the press and public are to be excluded. So moving on to item four, public questions. We were informed that somebody had a question that they wanted to ask, but I can't see that councillor here, and we've not had a question, um, so we don't have any questions, uh, so we'll have no 15-minute public participation. So on to item five, um, declarations of interest. If anyone does have any disclosable pecuniary interest or other, other interest to declare, in relation to the business on today's agenda, could they please come and see Jonathan and complete a form? 
on to item six, which are the minutes of our last meeting held on the 2nd of September. And they are attached in your agenda pack at page one. Um, are people happy that they're a correct record and I can sign and approve those? Thank you. Um, so, on to item seven, which is the COVID-19 pandemic update. Dr. Rupert Sucklin is going to be presenting this um, and he's going to give us an update with regard to the direct <coughs> health impacts in Doncaster and the steps being taken to address them. What I always like to say when we start each agenda is for people to be thinking about the recommendations and in this case it's to note the update from Rupert. Thanks Rupert. Thanks Rachel. So the, uh, the pandemic uh, uh, rumbles on uh, and despite Covid still leading to a large number of admissions and uh, unfortunately deaths in Doncaster there is potentially some reassuring news uh, for us. So uh, Richard and others uh, in the meeting will know that uh, there are upwards of uh, 50 people still in Doncaster Royal Infirmary with COVID and as many as a dozen on ITU. And that's been a position that we've seen gradually rise really throughout the summer. And the numbers now in hospital with COVID are similar to that we saw at the end of March in 2021. And uh, although that may not seem um, huge in terms of uh, numbers, that is a significant contributor to the pressures that we're seeing across the health and care system. And it's no um, coincidence that we've got uh, items on today's agenda around primary care, around children, young people's mental health, and at the end, the sort of the Better Care Fund uh, update. And Richard may want to sort of comment on, on what it's like in the, the hospital at the moment uh, as we go. The sort of potentially good news or reassuring news is that the rates that we're seeing in Doncaster are starting to fall. So the <coughs> Overall rates in Doncaster are now 343 cases per 100,000 people and the positivity rate, which is the number of people who are uh, having a test that tests positive for COVID-19, is now down to 10.3%. And that is a significant uh, reduction that we've seen over the last uh, three weeks. We have seen a smaller uh, reduction in the rates in the over 60s. And that's important because it's the rates in the over 60s that really lead to hospital admissions. But even though those rates are falling, they still are above the trigger criteria that we set ourselves as a place and as a local resilience forum uh, back in November. So those rates still require us to take action. And the action that we currently have got in place is the uh, hands, face, space, ventilation, but also the vaccine program and there is good uh, progress in terms of the COVID vaccination program with over eight, almost 80% 80 of people aged over 18 in Doncaster having received two vaccines, 60% of people who are eligible for the booster uh, having their booster and almost 60% of people who are, uh, have uh, immunosuppression having their third dose. And we have seen in the last uh, couple of weeks an increase in the number of people, eight, uh, children 12 to 15, having their vaccination. So that's up to almost 25% of children. That's a significant uh, increase. We have benefited from the two weeks half term in Doncaster for many of the schools, and that definitely uh, helped reduce the uh, transmission of COVID. And it's going to be the next 10 days that are really going to be important to see what's going to happen now. We are all hopeful that the uh, rates are going to continue to uh, reduce, uh, but there is a lag between when the rates reduce and when the uh, impact on hospital admissions happen. And that's generally about two to three weeks. So even though the rates are going down now, you're still looking at a very busy health and care system from the contribution of COVID, probably right through to, to Christmas. And the numbers of people that we've seen in our health and care system now you know, in early November are what we usually see in the peak of the worst winters that most of us have seen. So there's some sort of reassuring news around uh, COVID, uh, but the, it's still a significant contributor to the overall position that we're seeing around uh, health and care. Thank you. Thank you very much, Rupert. Um, often at this point, partners, uh, organisations want to come in and add anything. 
Um, we won't cover GPs at this point because obviously that's the next item on the agenda. Um, but I can see Richard. Thank you, Richard. Thank you, Rachel. Um, I would echo and endorse uh, Rupert's comments. The hospitals remain incredibly busy and um, recent data that we've looked at would suggest that in reality the level of pressure is equivalent to winter and has been since probably May of this year. So the numbers of patients that we're seeing and treating um, is relative to a normal winter at this point and therefore our concern is the potential impact in addition to rising COVID numbers of other normal winter viruses and the ones we particularly worry about are influenza and norovirus. And so the measures that Rupert's talked about, about vaccination, hand space and space, we would absolutely encourage our communities to um, adhere to, if at all possible, to take them on board, to do as much as they can, because what we witnessed last year in respect of those viruses was that those measures prevented any significant or serious norovirus or influenza outbreaks. And they will do so again this year if our communities get behind them. And, and that will take some of the pressure off um, the primary care general practice and off the hospitals. Rupert's figures are accurate for us. So as of this morning, we have 55 patients in hospital who were admitted and have active COVID-19. We've got a further 20 patients who are remaining in hospital as a result of a complication of COVID-19. And so we've been running at roughly sort of 70, 80, 90 patients per day for several weeks now um, and clearly the danger is that those numbers rise over winter because the second point of Rupert's real comments in respect to the hospital are around trying to recover from the impact of COVID-19 on extended waiting times for um, procedures but also for diagnostics and a huge amount of effort is going in to try to make sure that we continue with that recovery so the hospital is under two sides of pressure the emergency side and the elective side the emergency departments have been incredibly busy um, really since the public um, began to um, uh, attend hospital again after the initial COVID waves and we've seen some absolutely record breaking days in attendance terms, uh, well over 420 patients a day on a really, really busy days where previously it would have been 350, 360. Now these patients are attending for a multitude of reasons, but what we're also seeing is a um, significant rise in the acuity or the severity of the illness that the patients are presenting with. And uh, we believe in Rupert would probably echo that that's probably related to people not necessarily seeking attention at the point that they would have previously done so. And therefore symptoms have developed and have become more acute for them. So. Our admissions are very, very high um, as a result of attendances. So on Monday alone of this week, we admitted 110 patients through the emergency pathways to the hospital. And if um, uh, the um, wellbeing committee remembers, the total bed base of the hospital is 600. So that, that was um, a significant challenge for us. And clearly at the moment, we're in a difficult period as a health community because of the impact of the incident in the women and children's <coughs> where unfortunately um, we had some damage, major damage to electrical supply as a result of water ingress and we lost um, more than 40 beds from the total bed stock which if you obviously work the maths out is a significant amount that uh, to some degree is corrected at the beginning of uh, December when our modular builds come on uh, stream uh, and so that will help us but my main point would be to echo Rupert's um, real point and request for as much as possible our communities to get the vaccines when they're available to get the boosters when they're available and to follow hands face and space to help us with the winter pressures thanks very much for that richard um any other comments or questions no okay then thank you very much rupert and richard and uh, we're all asked to note that update and uh observe the suggestions in terms of the messages as both Richard and Rupert said. So on to item eight, which is improving access for patients and support in general practice. Really pleased that we have Anthony, Carolyn and Dean here to present this. We did touch on it at the last health and wellbeing board meeting. Um, so, and I think there were, we wanted to know what was happening. Uh, so to be able to understand that locally and what's expected would be very useful. 
Um, again, we're just asked to note this. Um, I imagine there will be lots of questions, so um, if you want to raise your hand as we're going through, I will write your name down and then come to you in turn, if that's okay. So, I think Jonathan's kindly just getting the presentation ready. Okay, thanks. Okay. Thanks, Chair, and thank you for the invite today to talk about a very topical subject, which is um, access um, in primary care. I've introduced myself. My name's Anthony, and Carolyn and um, Dr. Eggert have kindly agreed to uh, join me today for the presentation. We're, 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 go we're going to um, cover the current uh, setup of primary care across Doncaster and give a reminder to members um, of, of that. We're going to touch on the response that primary care undertook um, at the beginning of the pandemic and continues to do so. We're going to describe both national and local plans to address access and we're going to talk about the next steps in a communication campaign um, to support. Um, I think it's helpful as, as a context to note that whilst we recognise um, pressures and variation in access across primary care um, and some frustration in our public, um, we are committed to addressing this um, and um, impacting on it where we can within the current constraints that we have. So I thought it would... Uh, right. Okay. So it, it's always difficult to talk about primary care as a simple entity. Um, members will be aware that it isn't one. Uh, we have 50, 38 individual general practices um, ac across Doncaster, over, over 50 practice sites. And increasingly, we work with our five primary care networks across Doncaster. And just to remind members, primary care networks are uh, collections of GP practices working together um, with other providers um, to ensure sustainability and innovation um, across the geographical area. And we have five of those in Doncaster. And we also work with our GP Federation and the local uh, medical committee to work on local strategy and delivery of primary care across Doncaster. So just a reminder of the structure there. And it is important in context of this presentation um, that there is variation across Doncaster in terms of access. There was before the pandemic uh, and there is during. And that variation uh, relates to staffing, it relates to budgets, it relates to the variation in the way that appointments are booked and delivered. Um, and it's also important to note that primary care isn't only GPs and GP practices. Uh, we have a multitude of different professionals, um, nurses, OTs, physios, um, working within practices. And of course, we have other ways of accessing primary care, such as um, pharmacy um, and social prescribing, etc. So whilst I'll talk in the general, it's important to note that clearly there is variation across Doncaster. I would like to publicly thank primary care professionals for the way they quickly and effectively adapted to the pandemic at the start of uh, 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 early last year. Almost overnight, uh, practices ensured um, infection prevention um, control compliance, moved to a digital and full triage approach, changed the way that um, staff operated and appointments, um, and appointments were given all at a time when sickness uh, and staffing um, levels were, uh, were, um, were, were difficult. Workforce clearly remains a key risk to access in primary care, and we, I'm sure we'll return to that in due course. Some of the things we implemented included hot sites for COVID. Dr. Eggett was key to that implementation, and moving towards more digital and telephone appointments was absolutely crucial in keeping the wheels on the bus um, during the course of the pandemic. And um, it wouldn't, it would be uh, a miss of me to say, sorry, I'm faffing around with slides here. It would be a miss of me to say that um, from December last year, we implemented the all important uh, vaccination program. It's nearly a year's anniversary, at least it will be on the 7th, uh, 14th of December um, since, since that program was implemented. By that time, we'll have, we'll have administered over a half a million doses of vaccination um, in Doncaster and primary care has been absolutely crucial um, to that delivery. That has undoubtedly saved lives in Doncaster, um, stopped the, stopped, limited the spread of the infection and protected NHS services. And I re-echo re Richard's message about really encouraging the take-up of the vaccination programme and the booster campaign. Um, demand within practices since 
since we've since since the pandemic as in as undoubtedly increased uh, as we've moved out of the pandemic response, demand and capacity in primary care is notoriously difficult to measure, um, and that is down to the different ways practices operationally deal with the dem with demand that they've got. But we do know that a greater percentage of our population in Doncaster are needing to contact their, their GP practice um, than pre the pandemic. And the number of attendances has increased um, since, since February 2020. Now the method of that attendance has, has changed. Um, we have more telephone appointments, more digital appointments, more triage. And again, we'll undoubtedly um, return to that, uh, to, to, to that later. Um, we do ask practices uh, about their current pressures, and there's, again, there's clear variation um, across staffing pressures, appointments, call values, call val volumes. The headline is it's busy, and uh, Carolyn now is going to go on to some of the local and national uh, ways that we are trying to address that. Um, so yes, primary care access has become even more topical of late. There was a national plan for improving primary care access published on the 14th of October, and that had three key themes to it, which was looking at increasing and optimised capacity, um, addressing the variation and encouraging good practice, and also looking at the, um, the abuse levels that uh, our frontline staff are having, particularly reception staff, and introducing a zero tolerance policy. And paramount to all of this is making sure that our public is aware of their expectations and how primary care is working now. So public communications is a key part of that. As part of the national plan, it was announced that there'd be £250 million available through a winter access fund. We're anticipating that Doncaster's share of that is just over £1.3 million. Um, but to draw down that funding, we've had to submit a plan on the South Yorkshire and Bassett Law footprint um, and the deadline for that submission was quite quickly, so we just had um, 14 days to produce a plan. So the deadline was the 28th of October to do that. We've attached with the agenda papers the Doncaster version of the plan, um, and we're using that. It's not really a published paper as such. It's a working document for us to work through, develop an action plan for implementation, but it gives you a flavour of the things that we're doing in Doncaster. Um, so I'm just going to go through each of the three fit themes and just to pick out some of the things that we are doing in Doncaster to meet those requirements. <coughs> the first one is around infection prevention and control support. The infection prevention and control guidance has changed quite a lot throughout the pandemic and the recent guidance reflects a one metre social distancing uh, provided that there are mitigating factors in place. So there are different premises, different types of practices in Doncaster, and some find that easier to meet than others. There's requirement for ventilation, et cetera. So where practices might struggle to organize their waiting rooms or have access through the front door, we're supporting that through our infection control nursing team to give a, a appropriate advice to make the best use, uh, the most appropriate access for patients, but also to protect those patients and the staff accessing primary care. As Anthony mentioned, there are lots of different people now working in primary care um, compared to a couple of years ago through primary care networks. And um, our plan is to increase those additional roles. There's a currently just over um, 60 uh, whole time equivalents. We're increasing those this year to over 100 additional roles. And as Anthony mentioned, some of those are physios, uh, dietitians, podiatrists, clinical pharmacists working directly in primary care networks to support that workload. And of course, with the additional staff, it's where do you put them? Um, there's a perception that people need to see somebody face to face, which is more difficult if the premises aren't uh, big enough to house all these staff. So we are, through this fund, supporting developments in premises to enable um, some expansion where possible. We're also looking at how we increase capacity because there, aren't, there isn't a magic tree to dream up more GP, uh, <coughs> GPs and other staff. So we are looking at innovative ways to increase capacity through remote uh, locum support, GP flexible pools, which is an app that can be used to encourage uh, workforce to come into Doncaster to support our workforce. One of the key issues that we know we've got is access through telephone, and NHS England has got a scheme to look at cloud-based telephony going forward. 
but we're already doing an audit of our telephone systems across practices to make sure they're fit for purpose, to make sure that we really recognise the demand on the line, that we can monitor that and have callback systems, etc. So we're working on that now uh, and have included a considerable part of this investment in improving telephony over and above what the NHS England offer might be. Something I think that we all need to get better at is better use of the community pharmacy services that we've got available. They are increasing in their face-to-face -face, uh, appointments with patients. For example, a hypertension service has just recently been announced where they can monitor blood pressure in, in patients. And we need to make our public aware that that service is available. We need to make sure practices know how to refer into the minor ailment services. And we need to make sure that the response uh, when patients do access our pharmacies. We've mentioned the vaccination service, but of course it's the primary care staff that are delivering that service, even if it's not in a practice setting. So we have to take into account that workforce shift. Um, and there's lots of work around. How do we reduce some of the administrative burdens that there are? Nationally, they're looking at things like DVLA uh, letters that GPs need to write, uh, taking that away, that burden away from, from general practice. But there are also other things that we can do. Looking at pra uh, processes that happen routinely that could be done once instead of 38 times in 38 different practices. And we're actually looking at some uh, robotic, uh, innovative uh, ways of streamlining some of those processes going forward. And we've still got our extended access service arrangements and that's changed throughout the pandemic and now we're supporting general practice during core hours with additional surge capacity, particularly recognising the increasing respiratory rates in children and providing extra appointments um, in, in a central location uh, for practices to refer into if their appointments are um, less available. Um, the second part is around addressing variation and encouraging good practice. There is a wealth of NHS England data that has come out as part of the plan to identify where we might need to support practices that have high A&E attendances or where their appointments look less than they did pre-pandemic. Um, we know there's some issues with that national data, so what we want to do is work with our practices to make sure that we recognise what the actual, actual access issue is in each of our practices. We recognise that some practices really struggled through the pandemic. They've had a lot of staff sickness, uh, isolation issues, where they haven't had the workforce that they needed to deliver. So we are supporting as well through some of this funding, practice resilience going forward, looking at um, succession planning, all that kind of thing, to make sure we've got sustainable practices going forward into the future. There's also some things we can do around signposting, working on, on practice websites, making sure it's really clear to patients who are able to use the internet to find the most appropriate service for them so that they don't need to turn up to a GP practice to ask a question when it could easily be found online. And we know there are different types of access now and when um, the Royal College are going to produce some guidance about what's the most appropriate levels of face-to-face -face compared to remote um, and telephone triage, etc. And when that comes out later this year, we'll work with our practices on, on the Doncaster offer. There is national support through a time for care programme. We're waiting to hear the detail of that. So there's an expectation that where we identify that practices need that additional support, that they will access this national programme, which is going to focus heavily on access models. Um, and so we'll wait, wait for that and we'll support our practices through that. So as I <coughs> alluded to, we do recognise that there is some frustration uh, uh, amongst some of our public in terms of access to, um, to primary care. And it should be noted that I'm talking about a very, very small minority um, of, of people in Doncaster. What we've found is that uh, generally our population in Doncaster are very, very grateful for the services that are provided uh, in primary care and wider uh, across our health and social care services. However, there are, uh, there, there are times when... Um, we have in, uh, practices have seen an increase in, in, in abuse, um, particularly to reception staff, um, et cetera. Um, we have locally um, developed a, a zero tolerance policy and there'll be a number of local uh, news releases and social media messages across that. And there is a way, there is a way, a, a, a way of dealing with people um, which ultimately can, can um, end up in people being um, dismissed from the list of a, of a GP practice. We've done a number of open le letters to public uh, around access and <coughs> expectation, and we are going to embark on a, on, a, on a campaign to outline the different ways of working uh, within general practice. We have an MP briefing taking place on the 19th of November, and kindly uh, Councillor Blake and Councillor Smith have 
agreed to attend to attend that meeting where we will be attended by all our clinical directors across our primary care networks and, and Dean and other primary care professionals where we want that sort of ability to to, 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 to get the messages from the front line back back to our public as, uh, as well it's it's clear that um, that this isn't just an issue um, within prim primary care. We've already touched on the pressures across the health and care system in, in, in general. Um, we have joint winter plans across Doncaster uh, to deal with the very difficult months that we will go through over the course uh, uh, for the rest of this year and, and beyond. Um, communication with our public around choosing well, um, etc., and the wealth of services that are out there um, are absolutely crucial as part of this work. A further agenda item today is around the locality work that's got going on across Doncaster and bringing primary care to the fore of that, um, we feel is absolutely um, essential. The next steps really are development of local action plans to utilise the funding that Carolyn <coughs> mentioned. And that, um, you, you know, that will need, need to be tailored specifically to individual practices and individual PCNs. One size does not fit all. The problem that some practices have isn't the same that the, that, 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 that the others. And we will tailor that response using the, uh, the resource and the capacity um, that we've got. It will be difficult, but I do think there are, there are improvements that we can, we can make across general practice. We recognise that some of our practices aren't up to the level that they need to be, uh, but we need them to learn from er areas of really good practice that we have in Doncaster and share that good practice and innovation that we have. If I was to be asked what was the biggest risk to uh, primary care um, in the forthcoming months but years, clearly workforce is the one that, 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 stands, that stands out. And we haven't practiced this, but I thought it would probably be best to end the presentation with a little bit of a, a take on the front line, Dean, if that's okay. Yeah, sure. I mean, I haven't practiced this speech. It's really on the hoof, which is probably best, actually, because I can give you a front line view of what it's like at the moment. Um, general practice has evolved over the last decade very slowly in a controlled way because of the acknowledged restraints in funding and workforce. It's slowly been coming, we know it's been coming, and there's been this very slow evolution. And over the past 18 months to two years, of course, that has had to be catalyzed at quite a rate to cope with the, the demand of COVID on top of that. Now, it takes 10 years at least to train a GP. Um, so they're not coming. You know, there is no GP sitting around the corner to solve this problem. So the solution cannot be a deluge of GPs in general practice anymore. So I think we probably need to change our terminology. I think we need to stop thinking about general practice and start thinking about primary care. And I want you to consider primary care like the cottage hospital industry used to be. So each general practice, or should I say primary care unit, is really a hospital now, where your general practitioner is a consultant of primary care, leading a team of professionals to see a whole range of conditions that you wouldn't naturally have thought of as being about primary care in the past. Now, if that's new to us here, imagine how new that's going to be to our patients. The challenge of them accepting that, understanding that, and recognising that when you call primary care, you don't call your GP anymore. Actually, you might call your mental health worker. You might call your physiotherapist or your <coughs> pharmacist. But this is the future. And on top of that, actually, we need a digital workforce too, because all of those other workforces are going to struggle without the help of technology. So the future of general practice is actually primary care. It's about us working together, it's about us embracing technology, and it's about us helping take patients on that journey so they get to the right patient, the right person, sorry, at the right time. If we'd had 10 years to do it, that would probably be achievable. We've had two years to quickly adapt to that and we need to get cracking on at ASAP. So there's some education and buy-in that's needed from everybody to come on this journey with us. Thanks very much, uh, Anthony, Karen and Dean for that. Um, insight and really comprehensive presentation. Um, I'm looking for hands up, so I can s I'll just have a look around. Right so I've seen Jackie and Andrea up to now, Nigel, Phil. Okay, over to you, Jackie. Thank you. Thanks. Um, and I just want to thank um, Carolyn, Anthony, and Dean for that presentation, and also general practice because they have. Um, and primary care because they have absolutely um, stood up to the COVID challenge over the last two years. Just a couple of points as we've been going through, I completely agree with what Dean's said about primary care and it 
let's look at it as a cottage hospital. Um, but those mental health workers don't, uh, they take time to train as well, and so do other part, other um, colleagues in the, uh, in the sector. So what that means, I think, is it's not just about um, primary care trying to develop this model. Over the next, I think, year, two years, it's about working with our hospital colleagues, both in acute mental health, voluntary sector, all of that sort of, the whole sector, because actually we should be working as a team. And, and what we might want to do is if general practices and primary care is the front door of the system, actually we want those people at that front door. And so what we might need to see is some of our uh, colleagues that would naturally normally work in the acute sector, for example, might be have to be deployed in that sort of community cottage hospital model. So there's much more integration and collaboration that's needed over the next couple of years is what I would suggest. And I think as we move forward as an ICB and um, move forward as a Doncaster place, that's got to be something that we really tackle um, together in primary care and general practice has got to be absolutely sat around that table as the voluntary sector does with our current providers around that provider alliance. And so that's got to be an aim and am ambition. I think I just wanted to pick up as well, um, I think um, Richard really articulated it clearly, the challenge about doing the planned work and the unplanned work. And actually that's no different from primary care and, and general practice at the moment. Uh, so there's a lot of people with long-term condition management and all of that sort of thing that actually a lot of our primary care colleagues are having to deal with today's work today and that urgent element and that we've got to break that sort of... Um, We've got to break that challenge as well, in, not only in the acute sector, but also in, in primary care too, so that we are tackling today's urgent primary care, but we're allowing our um, primary care colleagues to focus on those long-term conditions and, and sort of patient management as well. Um, I, think we need, I, I think we need to all be saying, we get our um, patients and get our uh, Doncaster people vaccinated and encouraging them to do that. And it's a bit of a plea, you know, we all, we've all got a role to play in that, we're all employers, and we should really be supporting our, uh, our um, private sector should be really supporting employees to access, those, access the, the vaccination programme as well. And I think we need to pick that up as Team Doncaster, and, and I know we're having conversations with um, Dan about how the Chamber can support us in, in allowing that to happen as well. Because, you know, people have now gone back to work, um, but they need to be able to have a bit of time to go and get the vaccine. And then um, just the team's Doncaster approach to comms as well, and I know we've talked about that. I'm just really, I, I know, I can imagine the reasons why, but why we haven't got the catch it, bin it, kill it, whatever it is happening at the moment, when that's so important, as Richard said. And, and if we're not going to do that nationally, then let's do it locally, because I think we've got the skills and we've got the comms and we've got all of that to do that. And we can, you know, we've got a really receptive public as well in Doncaster. So just a few points I wanted to make. Thanks very much, Jackie. If it's okay with you three, I'll take the questions. Is that all right? And then we'll come back to you for a response. So, Andrea. Thank you. <clears throat> My question relates to um, something that's said in the NHS document. Um, it talks about um, it being important to find the 20% of practices, or it, it suggests you don't approach more than 20% of practices, but those where access is the biggest issue. Um, and I'd just like to hear a little bit more from you around that because um, my perception listening to people in the community is that there are people in Doncaster who are, as you, you, you use the word grateful, they are incredibly grateful because they know they're getting first rate service from their GP practices. But there are others who have concerns and, and that's, that's my concern really because I think that if we could bring up those that are at the bottom to the level of those that are at the top, the people of Doncaster would be, you know, very grateful and would be very well served. So can, can you just talk to me about those practices where you've got concerns? Thanks very much, Andrea. And then we had Nigel. Yeah, it's just, just a, um, well, a couple of comments, but also a question, really. Um, in terms of the comments, I mean, just to, to sort of like highlight what Andrea's been saying, really, is that that, that my, my perception is what I'm being told by my community is that, that there is issues with GP practices in terms of access, in terms of telephony as well at this moment in time. Um, I, I, I get this from people on the street, but I also get it as well from people um, posting on social media. And I realise, you know, it can be incredibly frustrating, obviously, for the GP practice at this time in terms of how they're working and how they're coming out of the pandemic with the backlog. And, and I understand that totally. And I think in the main, 
people's perceptions of, of GP practices and what's being done locally is, is extremely positive. But I've got to say, and, and I'll, I'll stress it again, I understand it's being amplified, particularly on social media, but people do have massive concerns within my particular community and, and wider as well, in terms of access, in terms of telephony, in that first instance. And I suppose what I'm trying to say is that, that, that there's, there's a seg segment to this action plan that deals with, um, I suppose, zero abuse, um, and a zero tolerance, sorry, for abuse, and, and obviously communication strategy. And, and you know, everybody gets, you know, frustrated. We all do. You know, I get frustrated in my day to day work. What, what I'd be extremely concerned about is that, that people that potentially can't articulate themselves very well, who are frustrated at the end of the phone, um, are just being stuck off of practices. What I'd like to see within your communications um, process is that you are actually actively informing and enabling and empowering local people to be able to, for them to be able to complain and challenge effectively. Because I think one without the other, it just doesn't work. You need to be able to say to them, if you are dissatisfied with this service, you need to do A, B and C, and you need to do it in this way. And that is about empowerment. It's also about education. If you're not doing that, I think that it's slightly one-sided, and I'd like to see that, obviously, within the, the plan. And, and lastly, the, what I'm going to just this, this is a question, really, is that I noticed that there's a, there's, there's, there's a massive, really good increase in terms of staffing from 64 to, I think it's 102, I've read, something like that. I, I, it's probably just me, but I can't understand. Is, is that is that long-term staffing, or is it just temporary under this funding? Is it something that's going to continue for, um, you know, um, well, permanent as such, or is it is it just over a, a process of time to get through some of the issues that you've currently got? Um, and very, very lastly, um, I, you know, the, the plan's really good. I know that it's obviously, is it going to be spent by the 31st of March, or is it a case of, you, you must have some sort of time scale for all these actions that you're undertaking, and it'd be nice to see them plotted against that, that plan, so we're aware of when you're going to be doing stuff and what time scale you're applying to it. Thank you. Th thanks very much. I've got Richard now. I can see you, th the three of you, frantically writing, and it's not a memory test. So do you want to answer those questions first, and then I'll bring in other people? OK. Um, I'll come in um, on Andrea's question first, if that's OK, and then Dean is going to pick up on ze zero um, tolerance, and then Carolyn's going to pick up on staffing and the uh, spending, um, Nigel. Yeah, 20% uh, of practices proved um, rather controversial. <laughs> and, and not so much. We, we recognise, I think I said in my presentation, that there are practices are not where we want them to be, both in terms of access, staffing, um, and indeed on occasions, the, the quality of the services um, that, 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 that they provide. The methodology for identifying those practices is what's proved the controversial thing. I think I hint, hinted at, didn't I, that measurement of of demand and capacity in practice has been notoriously difficult. And I'll give you an, I'll, I'll give you an example. And I think I, I sat next to Dean um, a couple of weeks ago and saw it in action. Pre the pandemic, there was a big push to increase the amount of telephone, appoint, telephone appointments, digital appointments of the way that we uh, delivered um, pr primary care. Obviously that was flipped on its head in the pandemic, that that then became almost the majority of the way that we, we were dealing with things. What our public have told us now is that they want a, an increase in the amount of, of, of return to face-to-face -face appointments. And there is undoubtedly times when that is appropriate. Um, uh, uh, appropriate. However, the methodology of measuring that is, is poor. So there are times when some of the telephone appointments that we have, they're 60 seconds at most, and they're appropriate and they're, uh, and they're delivered accordingly. For a practice that has got that to a T, it, it, they would almost be penalised in this approach because there was an increase. The, the, the want was an increase in face-to-face -face appointments. To me, it's all about appropriate uh, appropriateness, and that's what we've got to work with the practices on to make sure that they are set up to deliver face-to-face -face appointments in a timely fashion when it's appropriate to do so. Back to the twenty percent, we are we 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 have identified those. Um, and those are the practices that will be supported in the initial stage through the um, Time to Care delivery, um, delivery programme. Have I got that right? Time to Care delivery programme and some of the resource that comes with that £1.3 million to do so. So we will tailor the response to those 20% of practices in the first instance. 
Um, thank you for your question, Councillor Ball. I'll address the uh, zero tolerance, if that's okay. So zero tolerance policies are particularly challenging in healthcare to write and do in a very um, respectful way, because we know when patients are ill, um, some people uh, lose their temper, some people get frustrated, and most of them it's part of illness. And actually even more so, it's part of illness because the illness itself can sometimes lead to personality changes. So you, you act in such a way that is not normal for you. So I hope that we're very aware in health and social care that sometimes our patients come across in such a way that is not really representative of who they are. So we're quite used to that. What we're not used to, though, is those patients who actually aren't unwell. They don't have a disability that leads them to change their personality and approach, um, but are actually just trying to circumnavigate the queue. Um, and in doing so, the loudest shouter gets the appointment over somebody who may have a serious illness. So the approach for the zero tolerance is really directed towards those individuals that stand out as not being challenging because of a, a health problem, but more being challenging because of a system problem. So I hope it reassures you in some way that we're very mindful that people aren't um, challenging always um, because they're just being rude and we wouldn't kick them off lists willy-nilly. Actually, it's incredibly difficult to remove a patient from your list and there are many ticks that you have to get through to get to that stage. So we're mindful of that in creating the zero tolerance policy. But at the same time, to continue to employ staff in primary care, we need to protect them. We have a liability, a vicarious liability to them to make sure that they're safe <coughs> mentally and physically. And I think this is part of that approach to maintain our staffing levels. If we don't address this, we're likely to lose staff and the problem is going to get worse. But it's certainly not, not an effort to easily remove people from a practice list. Just to the uh, point about um, the ability for patients to complain effecti uh, effectively, we, 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 we do do that, um, Councillor Ball. That's either individually to the practice or to the, or to the CCG. Um, I know that because I've received one or two over the course of the last few months, and we respond to all of them um, appropriately. So on the workforce question, it was a very good question about the long-term future of the funding and, and the difficulty we're experiencing, I think, is a lot of these big pots of money are non-recurrent. Um, the additional roles are funded until March 2024 currently. I think our trick is, as Jackie alluded to, is about us all working together to actually make sure that these workfor this workforce, this new workforce, becomes invaluable and part of primary care. So we're working with RDASH, for example, on mental health practitioners. They're 50% funded by RDASH as they come in. And it's, so it's not just about general practice. It's about the wider uh, response uh, in Doncaster. Some of the workforce is the same workforce, whether they're clinical pharmacists or community pharmacists, they're the same people just working differently. And, it, uh, and we need to work quite quickly on how we sustain that post 2024. Having said that, it is part of the NHS long-term plan, which is longer term than the five years. So there may be a plan for the second half of that, but we're not quite sure what that is yet. Um, but as I say, it's making sure that we sustain that workforce going forward and prove their worth. There's an evaluation, for example, at the moment on social prescribing, uh, looking at how we might embed that better uh, into our workforce going forward. And, and some of our care coordinators, health and wellbeing coaches, they're already well embedded within the council frameworks, etc. cetera. Um, so that's a kind of a clue as to how we might try and sustain those going forward. Um, the second part, I think, was around the timescale for this. So the Winter Access Fund is meant to be from November to March, again, non-recurrent. Um, we, we've developed what we've called an Access Think Tank, and Dean's on that, also Primary Care Doncaster, to come up with the action plan. So what we could do is actually share that action plan with our milestones, with the timescales, with the money identified, so that you can clearly see what we're planning to do by when. That's probably the most helpful thing we could do. Thanks very much. Um, so we've got three other people that wanted to speak and then I am going to have to move us on just because we've got so many other things on the agenda and then I will come back to the three of you to ask about how we can continue this discussion um, and about the MP's briefing. So I've got Phil, then Rupert and Richard. Thank you. Um, I've just got three very quick things, Chair. Very quick. Um, good to have the perspective on variation 
and good to have the acknowledgement that it's something that predates the pandemic because the political football side of this, the national political football side of this is really unfortunate. Um, I know Councillor Robinson asked a question about poor performers. I think it would be really good to celebrate good performers. I know there's, there will be a reticence to talk about poor performance around the morale and so on issues in, the, in, in primary care in general. I'm not trying to put you on the spot now, but I think we need to get behind practices that have got a really good grip on local leadership um, and galvanise around them so that other practices can see that actually um, there's, there's a good benefit around partnership engagement with those. So just a question really about whether that feels productive. Um, question about access. So adult social care has got similar issues around access. Um, some good bits, some bad bits. Do you want to go on a journey together? And, and a connected question around, um, around locality working, and a good that Anthony mentioned that. Um, it was helpful that Dean, I know, I know some of us will know that primary care is about much more than general practice, maybe some won't. I don't really like the cost, cottage hospital analogy because it sounds very closed. It sounds a bit of a citadel in communities. Um, and actually, general practice has been under siege for a long time. So maybe that desire to build a citadel is, is understandable. But how do primary care colleagues want to work with wider community organisations so that we're not talking about access to primary care, we're talking about access for local people to good health outcomes, which requires a greater group of people than primary care to make that happen. Thank you, Phil. And then Rupert and then Rich. Yeah, that, and thanks for the presentation. And just echoing what Jackie said, you know, thanks to every, all the people who've done in primary care over the last, uh, well, two years now, isn't it, from the floods in Doncaster. So thanks for all of that. I think it is really good to see some of the inputs in the, the paper in terms of additional sort of investment. And I suppose it's sort of an offer really going forward to think about how we might start to demonstrate that in terms of measurement. So as you said, Anthony, measurement's notoriously difficult. I think if we wait for a national solution for that, we'll be waiting for a long time. And I think we probably owe it to ourselves to measure the things that matter to us and our local people and to be able to, to share that. So an offer, I think, for us to help maybe in the same way Phil's saying in terms of going on that journey together, how can we uh, help and work with you to, in terms of measurement and measuring what matters to, to local people. Thank you, and Richard? Yeah, thank you, Chair. It's a couple of comments, really. And, um, I would absolutely echo Jackie's thoughts and the thoughts of the presenters, really. And I don't think Dean's describing a citadel in the sense of a protected environment. What I think he's suggesting and what I would agree with is that if you take frailty, for instance, and the medicine of frailty, we often ask those patients to come to hospital. We ask them to undertake a journey in an ambulance to come for an assessment that could easily be done where they live. And it, it could be done by where they live, by my experts who are in the hospital, spending time in the community, which makes that a lot easier. So I think what we already know is that we've got localities with different challenges and pressures, and the model shouldn't be a hospital generated dominated model where we ask the patients to come to us we're going to have to in future go to the patients because it is much more productive in terms of the time spent and actually the value that can be got from that and that's the second point really in terms of I think general practice and hospitals are suffering from the same or similar challenges in that when the pandemic started the measures that were implemented from infection prevention and control reduced the capacity so they reduced the dead bed capacity by 10% because we had to do increased spaces between beds and we had to actually manage the flow of patients through the hospital very differently. So we lost 10% of the bed capacity. But in our outpatients, we lost up to 30% of capacity because the old outpatient model was a historical model from the early 50s where you have rows of seating and patients sat on them very close to each other and formed queues to go through to specialists. <coughs> With the pandemic, that's not possible. And because it's not possible, it affects the capacity and demand equation. And actually our consultants, our general practitioners, our mental health practitioners can see far fewer people in a session than they could previously because of the restrictions and the implement implications of the pandemic. So what we've got to do, I think, collectively is to um, decipher and explain a really complex issue and a problem to a public who mainly get their information from social media or from short news clips and uh, their perception is is that everything's gone back to normal and from their point of view normal is a face-to-face -face GP appointment or normal is 
an outpatient appointment or normal is. And we see it all the time with things like visiting because we get a lot of challenges. Visiting's back to normal because we don't need to wear face masks. And, you know, actually visiting isn't because the hospital as a closed environment in terms of a ward we have a four bedded bed bay if everybody turns up with two visitors we immediately break all the social distancing rules and regulations we're not protecting the patients we're not protecting our staff but to the public visiting is normal again so the amount of questions pressures challenges we get over what normal is is the problem and i think part of our challenges is that understanding why there's the variation, what's the actual exam question, solving the variations, the strategy, not which is the worst 20%, because their variation might be absolutely fantastic performance for them in the circumstances that they've got. It's about what does the variation tell us about how we can improve, but that actual journey, that message with the public about normal now is not what it was pre-pandemic. And actually what we've got to do to work together is to deal with the pandemic and it, it's here forever now it might hopefully lessen and its impact will lessen but we've got to adapt our services we've got to provide more local services so people don't come which in itself is a really good thing from our carbon footprint and other agendas local services local people reduce carbon all of these things will join up but the actual key is communication and making sure a really complex set of issues it's not determined to a 150 character tweet or a Facebook post because it's far, far more complex than that. And that's the key challenge is getting it across because I don't know any part of the health and social care system at the moment that isn't under a huge and enormous pressure and doing far more work than they did before. They're just doing different work. And at the minute, some of that work is invisible to the public for the reasons that I think we're talking about. Thank you very much. Uh, do you want to respond? Yeah, um, I'll try to do this really quickly. Do we want to go on a journey together? Yes, absolutely. That's what we're committed to across Doncaster, and we've got a good history of doing that in the past, so absolutely. Um, help with uh, monitoring and outputs of the work that we're doing? Absolutely. Bite your hand off at, at that. I think we need to get better at understanding the experience of our, of our, of our patients, um, as well as some of the crude measures that we've got in terms of measurement at, um, at the moment. Celebrate good performance, absolutely. But I also think it would be right to change the language of good and bad. I think we've got, we have got practices that are struggling, but they're struggling for legitimate reasons, be it recruitment, be it the, you know, um, estates, and many multitude of different reasons. And I think it's about support to those practices. And that's why those first 20% are absolutely crucial, I agree, because it's the tailoring support that we can, we can give to those. Um, in terms of um, comms and expectation, absolutely. You were going to touch, um, Chair, on the event on the 19th, but I think there's a real opportunity that we've got here to either use that event or use all the forums that we've got to help with our messages from the front line um, to, to our public around expectation about what the new normal is and, and, and help with that. And we'd appreciate that, wouldn't we, from, from everybody, from all agencies out there to help us with it. Okay, thank you. Um, I think we are uh, just on time, which is good. I found that conversation, the comments, the questions really, really useful. I think the things I clearly heard were that we have got to get better in terms of communication. Um, and I would make a plea that not everybody's on social media. You know, there are so many different ways that people find out about, in, about what's happening in their community, about how to access things. There's lots of community magazines. There's, there's people who are the go-to people in our communities who knows what's going on. So I really do think we've got to take a radical approach to communicating with people and under, finding out first how they understand things. Really great to hear about that we are going to go on this journey together. Because um, I think it was it was Jackie that started off the conversation in terms of, you know, this isn't just happening to primary care. It's not just happening to social care. It's not just happening to the voluntary sector because we need to we need to recognise that they too are under huge pressure. Um, but collectively, I think what we have in Doncaster are the systems that other areas don't have. So we have localities. We have a health and social care forum. We have Team Doncaster. So if we can't manage it in Doncaster to actually join this up, get a better service and enable people to 
access the services they need at the right time, then I don't know which areas can. Um, so it'd be great if we can revisit this perhaps in six months' time. Um, I wasn't quite sure, Anthony, in terms of that event on the 19th, whether people can submit questions, whether they can even attend, that would be useful to understand. Um, I have got a number of questions, but we've run out of time, so, and I'm sure other people have as well, so it'd be great to understand, Rupert, how we carry on this debate, whether we need a particular health and wellbeing board just to talk about access generally and communication and how we can do that. Um, but over to you, Anthony, in terms of the 19th for now. Yeah, we will be sending out a briefing um, on that. And what I, I appreciate your help, Rachel and Sarah, as well. If you know, can gather questions that are out there from from other constituents. We've got a lot already, and they'll be along the same the same themes. Um, but I'll send a briefing out on how that event's going to work and how we'll communicate back out as a result of it as well. Right, thank you ever so much. Thank you for attending. Um, we do appreciate it. Um, and echo our thanks to everybody in primary care, everybody at our hospitals, um, in our social care and voluntary sector who really over the last two years have done an amazing job under incredible pressure. And we all read about that pressure that isn't going away. So certainly on behalf of the Health and Wellbeing Board, I would like to thank everybody. Um, and look forward to continuing this journey and this discussion. Thank you. And then we are on to our next item, which is equally important because of what's happened with COVID. And the agendas are so long, I've got a whole page for just one item this time. So we're now going to hear from Lee and Andrea in terms of children and young people's mental health. Um, we're going to hear about what the data tells us and what do our young people want. I think we've all seen in the media, whichever one you access, how difficult the last couple of years in particular have been for our young people. Um, not as though it wasn't easy before. We all know that in terms of happiness surveys and things. So it'd be really good to understand um, what's happening with young people in Doncaster. As I always do, as we're here in the presentation, can I please ask you to think about the vision and ambitions that our young advisors are going to talk us through and whether you agree with those. Um, and also to consider what improvements could be made to the way the data and information is collected, recorded and shared to develop a more efficient work in practice. Thanks, Lee. Thanks, Rachel. Morning, everybody. Uh, just before I start, unfortunately, we're not able to have any young advisors with us today because they couldn't, couldn't get out of school, uh, which is fine, but I've heard their presentation a number of times so I can convey on their behalf. And I'm also delighted that Christina's actually in the room, so there might be some questions that you ask that Christina can chip in with as well. Uh, but I'll make a start. And as you, as you said, Rachel, the Health and Wellbeing Board asked for an update on children's mental health. It's been a really uh, high profile uh, topic over the last 18 months. We're going to try and set the scene in terms of data and intelligence and what we know. We'll highlight what's being done. Uh, we'll also highlight some potential risks that we've got moving forward. Uh, and we're also going to kind of set a bit of a precursor uh, and set some of the vision and ambitions that the Young Advisors have done in preparation for us coming back in the new year with a new three-year Children and Young People's Mental Health Strategy. I've touched on that. So what is the data telling us? I'm going to lift out some of the key bits here. Uh, there is lots and lots of data that we've got and we have supplemented this presentation with a mapping document that captures a whole range of data but I'll lift out some of the, the key ones. We can see that non-urgent referrals into specialist camp services have gone up from 19 to 27 on a monthly basis. We can also see in the top right quite a, a really important one that caseloads for our community eating disorder service has doubled, if not more so, and that is an area that we've really seen some challenges with over the last 18 months, in particular the number on caseloads, but also those uh, having episodic periods of crisis and I'm being in a, an acute setting, be that the hospital, as I'm sure Richard will testament to, but also acute inpatient beds. We've seen challenges around uh, the number of children in schools with 
social, emotional and mental health needs, and that's gone up. Although that is only a small percentage, though the findings from the lifestyle survey that we're going to talk about later on kind of reinforce that. We are also seeing a lot more issues within the school, and it was noticeable that our local group that manages uh, young people's periods of crisis in around mental health saw increases when children returned back into school, in particular uh, after the summer holidays. Another one just to mention is that we've seen increases in children waiting for ADHD assessments, and again, linked into children returning into school. There is massive pressure uh, on us all around supporting children and families that have got a neurodevelopmental difference, be that autism or ADHD. And the final one just to lift out is uh, around social care. The forensic psychology team in the trust has doubled their monthly consultations, which means that the demands and pressures around wellbeing and mental health for children that are looked after has also increased. A couple of other interesting things to, to flag. Pleasingly, on one hand, we are seeing numbers of children and families being supported within our early help arena return back to pre-pandemic levels. We have more children and families accessing early help and more of those that do access it are staying and going on to a formal pathway. Interestingly though, within that, we've seen some big increases in the uh, prevalence around not only ch children's mental health, but also parental mental health, with both of those figures increasing. And the, the one on the right, the support for families around emotional well-being is now the most, is the number one reason whilst families are accessing early help for support. And that's gone up from 42.8 to 70.5, so a significant increase. <clears throat> the other bit below is in Doncaster, um, this may crop up in some of the questions, we have a really effective multi-agency working group that looks at children with social and emotional mental health, in particular those that end up in an acute setting or at risk of an acute setting through a dynamic risk register. It includes social care, it includes health colleagues, it includes education. In essence, where we think children are at risk of uh, significant self-harm or entering an acute setting, everyone gets together and see what can be done to try and keep them in the community. They manage a really good uh, risk register and actually, the good outcome from that is that we've maintained really low numbers of children in, in a tier four and acute inpatient setting. We currently only have two, not, with, not including our eating disorder services, one of which will be discharged on the 15th. Can I just point out, you are. I'll just point out at that point with the, uh, what we call the social, emotional, mental health uh, um, meeting that we, we do on a weekly basis throughout the pandemic and that started really early on as we saw the, the increases of children presenting at uh, Doncaster DRI. I'm not going to go into detail but um, this is something that is exclusive as good practice in Doncaster alone, it's not done anywhere nationally and it's picked up from the Transforming Care Programme that does the same for uh, uh, autism and LD children look and um, learning disability children we took that learning from that and we developed it into this different cohort we don't do that anywhere else in England and it has been picked up by NHS Confed and was published in the Tipping Point publication and also is looking to uh, be part of the uh, NHS CCG legacy document so it's been recognised as uh, significant practice that that we do in Doncaster and it's so important that it brings our health and social care and education colleagues all together to understand the wraparound needs of that individual child and their family. So I just wanted to add that on. Thanks Andrea. I mean interestingly the, the, the diagrams at the bottom evidence the breakdown of those children that have presented at the SEMH group. Normally that would be well, I think a stat to bear in mind is that on average there might be 20 to 30 pre presentations at A&E. In the last 18 months we've had 300. Now, they are for varying issues. The, the tables, at the, sorry, the diagrams at the bottom highlight the levels of risk and the breakdown of, that, of those being discussed. So the vast majority are female, the vast majority are aged, well, a quarter are aged 15 and nearly a half are coded as what we call intentional self-poisoning. That is predominantly ingestion or prescription 
tablets, either their own or family members, in particular paracetamol. So it's just to bear in mind. And then really interestingly, and you might not be able to see some of these figures, but I'm going to lift them out. So there's been a really extensive pupil lifestyle survey that's been done that has a whole range of questions about uh, of children and young people. The ones that are really interesting, I think, are the ones about how happy do you feel with your life at the moment and what makes Doncaster children sad or worried? If we look at the top one around what makes you feel happy, there's been a decrease in those children describing themselves as very happy, but an increase in those that describe themselves as okay, uh, but also those that are led by a once increase of those not happy. Now, there are a whole range of subjective factors within that, but it is quite an interesting uh, finding to share. The other one around what makes children sad or worried in Doncaster is that there's almost a doubling in those that are saying that mental health does that. Family problems, the way they look, and being bullied uh, also remain there. The takeaways from this survey mainly is that less children reporting high levels of resilience and less children saying that they are listened to. I'm just going to flick the slides around a little bit because I want to come back to the strategy at the end. So what are we concerned about? So we have had difficulties accessing acute inpatient beds. There simply haven't been enough beds in the country for our children and young people to access and at times those have been too far away from home. And as Andrea pointed out before, we've got really good local systems and processes in place to keep children in there. Our numbers are low compared to other areas, but we are still finding challenges. I know that Christina and colleagues are having weekly meetings with NHS England who commission those beds uh, to try and uh, unlock some of the challenges, and we are continually lobbying. There's been an increased demand upon capacity in terms of managing crisis lines and responses to children and young people on a 24-7 basis. So the CAM service are looking at uh, mapping out any, any gaps, analysing those and potentially remodelling the crisis and intensive home treatment services to reflect the changing needs that we've seen over the last 18 months. As I mentioned before, we've had too many children and young people attending A&E, putting extra pressures when the uh, hospital needs them the least. It's put incredible pressures on some of the nursing staff on the wards. And I, I do think we should formally recognise that and the amazing job that they've done supported by the community eating disability service over the last 18 months. It's been really tough. Uh, what we've took from some of that though is that we've really improved our interaction between those children that do present with risk and feeding that information back and supporting their school placement. So previously before there was not that connectivity whereas now schools are fully aware around what the risks are for some of their young people and we've got support in there and that includes over 60, 600 trauma informed professionals within school settings, it improves the dedicated with me mind service and it improves a whole lot of work that we're doing with schools because as we know and I'm going to pinch a stat from Rupert here there's a, a recent research from Cardiff that highlights the reliance of pupils on teachers. 90% said they uh, uh, tr were trusting of teachers and, they, and teachers uh, were supportive of them. So we know, don't we, for the vast majority of children and young people, they don't have diagnosable mental health, but they have, they have challenges around managing their well-being. They don't really need a specialist CAMS worker. They want somebody that they are trusted, family, friends, teachers, and that's very much the model that we're going to be embracing moving forward. Can I just add, Lee, to the, um, the presentations into DRI uh, and um, ED? Uh, um, yes, we have seen an increase. I don't think that's any different to, to nationally, to be honest. But our responses from that, I think we've created a really strong network across that in reaches into DRI. And we work really closely with the children's ward and ED. Uh, through various ways, it's brought CAMS, ED, um, DRI, Children's Ward, the CCG and the local authority all together to respond and I think that that has been born from the need to really be responsive and how do we support ourselves as systems and work together and it's a recognition that we can't do it in silos, we can't do it, CAMS can't do it alone, DRI can't do it alone, 
we need each other so I just my plea is that we continue to work in such a way that sort of puts them kids right at the heart of what we're doing Okay, I'm just conscious of time. So the only one, only other uh, risk I wanted to lift out was the increased pressure on eating disorders, but extra capacity and resource has been put into the service to try and cope with that. We touched on some of this before. Uh, again, I'll just lift out a couple of pertinent ones. And the one I really want to lift out is that this time two years ago, we didn't have a dedicated strategy around supporting schools around mental health and well-being. Now we do, and there are kind of seven key themes to that, which, and we've got regular briefings which we can share uh, with the group if you want. The main themes, though, are the SEMH group, so we're clear on who those children are and how we can feed that information back into schools. The expansion of the With Me In Mind CAM service, Doncaster successful in wave eight of the Trailblazer, which brings in more money, almost a million pounds extra per annum into Doncaster, which will give us more dedicated mental health support teams in schools. The school nursing service has really uh, helped plug some of the gap and is responding and supporting schools where we've had challenges around mental health. Our young advisors have done an amazing job throughout the pandemic in terms of peer support on social media, but also uh, in terms of helping us develop a new vision and a strategy which we'll touch upon. And then the other bit that I really wanted to lift out is that we've now developed an extensive support and training package to schools, including trauma-informed practice, including peer support, including sharing best practice, and a real open dialogue about where some of the where we've got some really schools where we have more challenges than others and how we best support them. I would say that we have more awareness and expertise in schools around well-being and mental health than we've had for a number of years, including dedicated mental health leads in schools. So the last few slides have kind of set the scene, touched about some of the risk, what we're doing. What, what we've wanted to do alongside that, I'll come back to that slide in a sec, was think about, right, we've been managing all this for the last two years, so what are we going to do? What's our strategy for the next three years? Uh, and I've got that excited about that. I forgot to mention the systems flow mapping which I'll come back to at the end if we've got time. I think it just shows actually there's a lot out there and there's, it's very complicated and complex. So, I've gone the wrong way. We thought, okay, so we need to set a new vision for children's mental health in Doncaster and actually it was a better place to do that than our young people. So we, we asked our young advisors to go away and do that. They've done a whole load of pop-ups in town centres, they've been to the football ground, they've been into schools. I think if you were under 18 and you stood still long enough, you were asked what your thoughts were around this. Uh, and this is what they've come up with. Uh, and the vision is to ensure that every child and young person in Doncaster is aware of and has access to local, immediate, quality mental health and wellbeing support. They want to ensure that services are organized and organizations are working collaboratively and information is easily accessible. That was a point that really jumped out. We want to see more education for young people, parents and carers and professionals around recognising and supporting the needs of, young of a young person. They want to break the stigma, encouraging children and young people to talk more openly and not to feel ashamed about mental health and wellbeing. They're asking for identification and support early. They're not asking for specialist services. I think that's a really important point. And there's some comments that young people have made under that. Uh, which is lovely, we've got a vision, but what's more exciting in some ways is that they're now saying to us, well, that's fine, but actually we've now got uh, nine ambitions that we want, and they've, and they've cleverly done that under the use of the term well-being. And again, you'll have seen the presentation, but what they want us to do, and they're really clear, they're gonna hold us as a partnership to account for delivery against these within the strategy, which I think is really exciting because it becomes more than words on a page but they want wellbeing hubs. They want places to go in their communities where young people can go and speak to someone. Okay, be that schools, be that part of the localities model, be that family hubs, be that GP practices. They want to be able for young people to be made aware of their emotions and how to express them. They want lots of learning and education around identification and support in young people, which will help break some of the stigma. They want to be listened to, and which I also think is a really nice one. They want to be kind to yourself and to others. 
And I think that's a really important one and really powerful from our young people. They want to be empowered. They want access to information. And what they're saying is they want access to information easily. What are some of the worry is they don't know which information is reliable or not. Where do they go to look? What does that look like? Uh, they want the needs. So meeting the basic human needs of every child in Doncaster to feel happy. And again, I think that's a lovely one because it's looking at cause rather than symptom. And growth to make sure that children and people have the support to reach their potential. We, I'd be delighted to bring back the strategy because our, our challenge now is to take this away, build a really clear strategy and a plan and deliver on this with some products about, well, actually, this is now what we're going to do and this is how we'll know the difference. And as part of the recommendations is we'll come back in the new year, if that's okay, and present that to you. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. I think we started off um, quite... Well, I was really saddened by some of those statistics in terms of how young people felt and, and obviously the access. But then to finish off with what the young people have said they want, I think, as hopefully uplifted people's spirits as well and very clearly we've got to deliver on this you know it's, it's not we may do it's got to be something that we do aware that some people have got to go so questions Nigel I've got Lucy yeah thanks very much for that Lee yeah I mean just to echo what Rachel said I mean clearly very uplifting towards the end and I think it's right about the accountability as well I mean they want to see something coming back from this not just words so that that's really positive a um, couple of questions and I am conscious that I've got to go but I'm, I'm going to ask them if that's okay just in terms of your risk profile you mentioned obviously the the crisis lines um, and that there's a mapping exercise being undertaken so so how long will that mapping exercise take and once you've identified gaps what are we going to do about them because I see that as a, as a central point, really, to be able to get that, that initial contact, you know, straight away. And secondly, just around presentation, um, sorry, presenters in the DRI. Clearly, this is an issue, and, and you're struggling as well, Richard, in terms of, you know, in terms of the number of people presenting at this moment in time. So is this being dealt with effectively by the DRI? I mean, how is it being dealt with? Um, is this improving? But also, is, th is this just another issue that, that's coming from the primary care in terms of, obviously, people not being able to get seen and not being able to get treatment and effectively just presenting up at DRI? So I think it'd be good to get that clearer picture on what are the issues around that and why are people feeling the need to present at DRI when, effectively, it could be the case that they've been trying to get treatment, they've been trying to get access in some way, shape or form, and that's not been available. So it'd be good to get clarity on those two points. Thank you. Okay, Lee, do you want to answer first? And if Richard, second, lovely, thank you. Oh, you'll take the second one. Thanks. Do you want, would you like me to answer those, given that um, I lead the uh, CAM service? Oh, yeah, thanks, Christine. Okay, so um, just about um, crisis lines. We've been looking across the country, really, at crisis lines, and actually children are not really ringing crisis lines. It's not their mode of uh, contact really that said you know we should still have those in place in case that is what children want so we're working with the South Yorkshire Ambassador Law as to do we want one crisis line or do we just want a Doncaster crisis line and the long term plan and the um, the mood coming out is that actually 111 is a crisis line and should we just work with 111 better so that children are clear how to contact but actually what we have is a robust system behind that 111 so we're working on that um, uh, now the other thing that we're putting into place there is um, uh, e-clinics we've got e-clinics so again which is something that young people are much more um, uh, pleased about so actually it isn't um, like the MS teams that, because they don't want their face to be on but what they want to do is almost like an instant messaging on that kind of e-clinic and what we could do there is do that much uh, wider so that is in place now and this is all part of this crisis response we're also looking at um, working with um, the emergency department and children's world about virtual so that if a child is in um, the emergency department we can do a virtual assessment so that's much quicker so we can get that child out of um, the emergency department 
or um, talk to them on the ward because they may have questions that they've, they've met with their CAMS worker, but actually they've thought of things and they want to ask those again, so we're doing that much more virtually. We've also um, um, had investment from the um, uh, uh, commissioners, and that's about us providing 24-7 crisis teams. So we're investing, sorry, it tells me I have to do my blood sugar at half past ten, <laughs> sorry. Um, so we're investing in 24-7 um, crisis teams. So that will be dedicated staff who will work, um, obviously, 24-7. And we're also increasing our intensive home treatment teams to a seven-day working. So at the minute, we might have young people who... Um, on a Friday are feeling unwell um, and actually we will work with that young person but we don't see them again till Monday morning. So what we're looking at is that we've got Saturday and Sunday support um, and what we need to do there is so increase the crisis teams, increase the home intensive home treatment teams that can see young people as four or five times a day if that's needed in their home but also increase our CAMS teams because um, we don't want to keep our to, to block up our crisis and intensive home treatment. We've got to have a flow of children as their uh, mental health um, deteriorates or whether it, it um, improves, that they can be moved up and down that system. So that's uh, some of the crisis response. Uh, where are we with that now is that we're out to consultation with our staff. So the business case has uh, been put through. Um, we've got the funding and we we have to consult because it means a change of terms and conditions. That ends um, uh, mid-November. No staff are really arguing against this, but it is still the process that we have to follow. Once uh, the consultation closes, we will be out to recruitment very quickly to increase those teams. Um, what was the second question? Because, yeah. Well, I could start on the second question and then if anybody wants to, to dip in. So I think the uh, um, gentleman said that it was around his concerns around presentations at ED and were DRI able to, to cope and manage that appropriately and well and, and were children presenting there because they couldn't get anywhere else. <laughs> so I think the answer to that is to be really clear of the presentations that come into DRI are usually in response to a... Um, uh, an attempt to harm them, children themselves or take their own lives at that point they want to. And I think that's all about uh, um, their emotional regulation and their ability to cause the, to handle and cope with stress at a certain time. And this is not... Pr children don't often present because they've got mental health problems. It's because they're reacting to a situation that they can't cope with at that time. And that will need a wraparound care. I think that that's why what we do is we're referring to the weekly SEMH meeting that we talked about because that provides us with wraparound care through education and social care. Um, in terms of the response at DRI, there is a, a, a liaison that sort of can base liaison in there uh, uh, that works closely in ED, so we do respond. Usually we'll find the admissions into DRI around the eating disorder elements, and that's when children need physical uh, uh, care, and then that comes prolonged because they also need that extra tier four care that we ca we're unable to get from a national perspective at that time, and how do we care for them while they're in that setting? So um, that's my answer to that, and I don't know if it, that evokes any more questions, but my also my suggestion is, Lee's talked about how we tackle uh, mental health and emotional well-being early, and talking about education. Well, my early is the not fives, the emotional literacy, the, the primary school children that become able to regulate their own emotions that may be living in distress or or situations especially over the pandemic or are frightened of what's happening how do we help those little children to to be happy and and to thrive before we get them to teenagers and when they're presenting with the self-harm in into our local hospitals thanks andrea uh, i've got lucy um, I'd just like to offer, really, I think if we're developing a three-year sort of mental health, children and mental health, you have to have a creativity strand within that. So at DARTS, even though we've been working with children for the last 30 years, I would say the last 10 years, 
all we've been focusing on is exactly what you're talking about. It's emo emotional uh, resilience. It's about being able to connect with others, to speak, to listen, to interact, to be able to communicate what we've got up here, which is about how do I express, how do I understand my emotions and then how do I express my emotions? So you have a vast range of expertise that is here. I would love to see that um, threaded throughout the strategy. Um, some quick examples. So you're talking there also about the sustained year on year increase in the number of children with a diagnosed special, special educational needs. You know, we work in every single um, special school within Doncaster on a weekly basis, particularly with people with profound disabilities, to think about how people can express their emotions, their choices, a um, whole range of different things. We've currently got a piece of work called Creative Classrooms, which is working in primary schools to use drama to, to develop uh, emotional literacy, um, to develop resilience how to express your emotions. There's just huge amounts of stuff. CAMs are actually at the point at the moment, our home. So because there's such a waiting list, uh, they're developing and um, delivering at our building um, group creative activities for whilst young people are waiting to get onto the waiting list. Um, I, I kind of could go on, there's absolutely masses there. So I'd really love to be able to work with you both um, on that, if that's okay. Thanks. Uh, Lee, Andrew, do you want to come back? And then I've got the final question from Richard. Uh, yes, Lucy, please. <laughs> we'll be in touch. Thanks, Lee and Richard. So, so mine's not really a question, it's just a comment. I think um, I would absolutely agree that DRI can cope with the patients, the children who present with the poison, which is the, the point that they, they make, because that's what the ED service is set up to, and then the wraparound services come in to help and support the recovery. I think the interesting thing in terms of these statistics is one of the greatest deteriorations was was potentially in the way that people or the children see themselves and their appearance and I suspect that's what's driving the actual eating disorder demand because that's been our greatest problem towards the um, end stage of the first phase of COVID was the number of children who were presenting with severe eating disorder issues and requiring inpatient admissions and then requiring intensive and extreme support um, at that acute phase and so one of the key challenges I think is that how do we address that because I suspect that is an impact of the pandemic because the kids were locked up as well they couldn't go to school their eating and their exercise was probably severely affected by you know the, the just the measures that were affecting adults and so we probably have a pent-up demand here that does require and the strategy does require really intense effort because we know from our other strategies that those first thousand days and then onwards are what make healthy adults who contribute you know to the things we want to achieve so i would you know absolutely support and echo that because we can cope with the issues of the children presenting in ed but what we don't want is them presenting in ed because that's the measure of success. The, the less people present in extremists, the more successful our plan has been, I would think. Okay, thank you, Richard. And just Rupert wanted to come in there. Yeah, thanks, Rachel. So just to, um, I suppose, echo some of what Richard said in terms of the role of social isolation and the impact of social media. You know, it's obviously an area that we need to take action now to address the needs that we're seeing at the moment. But as Richard said, you know, this is the next sort of generation and not only for mental health, but also then for other physical uh, challenges. And I suppose just as we go into the next item, which is about Doncaster delivering together, it's really good that that needs element is on there because there's stuff for others of us that, you know, have a contribution to, to making that area, whether it's about housing, whether it's about poverty, whether it's about jobs. And actually we need all of that to, to make a difference. But I think we'd all welcome uh, having involvement in the development of the strategy and uh, Rachel I think you know seeing that um, back here would be really good and us then sort of seeking assurance that that is delivering over the coming years would be very helpful. Yeah thank you very much so we look forward to seeing that come back. Um, I can't see any more hands so we are obviously asked to note the information presented and obviously welcome you back in the new year. I haven't heard any dissent in terms of the vision and I think it's quite the opposite. It's very good that the young advisors who do some amazing work in so many different areas have come up with something that's so clear. Perhaps they could get a job in government uh, in future because we can all understand that. 
Um, we can't understand what government wants. Anyway, because the press have gone, so I can say what I want. Um, and then the last thing is to consider what improvements in terms of the data. And did you get did you get that, Lee, from us? Yeah. Yeah, we did, Rachel. Thank you. And also, we'll we'll list some of that out in the strategy, if that's okay. Okay. Thank you very much, Lee, Andrea, and Christina's input there. Um, and I think you have left us in a good place in terms of people's young people's health and well-being so thank you um you're welcome to stay if you if you want to stay for the whole meeting andrea but please go i'm sure you're very busy if you need to okay thank you so we're on to item 10 which is doncaster delivering together members of the board we've had lots of presentations we were really involved in in the way that this was um developed produced so Alan's just going to give us a quick 10 minutes in terms of the next stages um, to explain to us. Um, we can receive and comment upon the presentation and the outline what Alan's going to present in terms of the proposed way forward um, and how we implement this strategy. Thanks, Alan. Uh, thanks, everyone. Good morning, everyone. So um, there's a few things we're going to cover off. I came in... Uh, September, I think, because just as we were in the midst of agreeing this, and also spoke a bit about the JSNA as well. So this is kind of, as I said, as uh, Chair has said, this is a bit of an update about where we've got to and what we're going to cover. So I'm going to talk a little bit about what's been agreed and where you can find some of that. Talk a little bit about implementation and the ways of working. A little bit about how that Health and Wellbeing Board can help that situation, and also think a little bit about what does the journey ahead look like. So it, it, it's agreed, I suppose, is probably the, the first thing to say. It's all there, it's designed up, it's ready to go. It's on the Team Doncaster website, which has been enhanced and is also going to go for a review over the next few weeks, so it'll look even more uh, 21st century for those who will visit it. Uh, so it's important, if you want to access anything, it's all there, it's all accessible, so if you want to point people to it, it is all there, ready and waiting to go. Um, there's a couple of things that I said last time, which is around, it's all very well having that, but we do need to make people aware of it and let people know about it. So there are a series of communications that has, go, has gone out and will be going out. So there is going to be nine media clips. So the first one was describing it overall. And then there will be one for each of the great eight priorities. Two are out. The third one should be going out tomorrow or Monday. So actually really starting to kind of drip feed these out. Now, the two purposes of that, one is to kind of... Um, engage people now to kind of say look it's happening I really to do that but it's another thing actually it's something to revisit and kind of really understand what we're trying to do here and so those things feature real people try talking about what matters to them with that particular priority so it's it's really a tool to really kind of cement that in everyone's kind of mind so hopefully people have had chance to look at them and uh, they are over the next three weeks we're going to drip the, the the other uh, other six or so out so hopefully that's going to be a real nice compendium of uh, local people telling us about what, what they want for the future. The other thing is, I, I think I gave a demonstration about some of the JSNA uh, dashboards last time I was here. They are live now on the same website. That's a screenshot up there. They are all ready for you to use, click and enjoy. We will also want to in, uh, uh, kind of create more of those in the future. So actually there's two on there at the moment around demographics and think about the outcomes from the JSNA. We want to create more and there is enough work and suggestions about what dashboards we could have uh, to kind of certainly fill three or four years worth of work so we do want to kind of have that out and the reason we do that instead of more static what we've done before like pdf profiles we do that because actually we want to keep these updated so it's a place where people can go and know that that's the information that we're talking about uh, so in terms of implementing and measuring progress uh, i think we've already mentioned on a previous item that we don't want the strategy just to be a strategy and just to be words so how, what does a, a kind of an implementation look like so the first thing is is we've got our kind of eight priorities in there they're kind of our portfolios or our umbrellas of work these are the things we want to kind of plug into i think they're broad enough to act as those portfolios and umbrellas of work so we can kind of get a sense of if we're talking around tackling climate change or we're talking around ha healthier happier and longer lives what are some of the big things that we're doing as a collective partnership to do that and to assess ourselves about how things are going uh, we have a Team Doncaster Summit. Hopefully most of you have had invites uh, to that on the 25th of November. If not, please let me know. 
It'd be great to see you there. The idea of that summit is to really start to think about, well, how do we deliver this? How do we do this together? What are some of those key things that we need to get right over the next 12 months to really set ourselves up going forward? Um, things may not change, but we do need to think about how the partnership operates. So um, uh, if we agree this is what's important to us, uh, are we configured in the best way? And it might be that we are, but having that time and opportunity to do that's really, really important. Making sure our investment activity aligns to what we're trying to achieve. And again, sometimes it's, it's almost um, overwhelming, isn't it? The amount of uh, interventions, in initiatives and activities that we're projects that we've got going on. But really, if we can kind of use some of those, those eight priorities as umbrellas for that, again, it starts to really help us understand the distribution of our investment activity and what we might want to do going forward. Having that real sense, and again, this has been mentioned already before, around a sense of our kind of localities, making sure those locality plans are set out and are helping us to deliver those things that matter to local people and building that bridge between our kind of big strategic intent and what matters to local people is really, really important. And I suppose finally on some of those actions is that it's all very well and good about having um, a big borough strategy and it's, it, you know, it, it is a key keystone for what we want to do going forward. But actually, there's other things that unpack that. We've spoken around uh, mental health earlier about really getting into what, what's the kind of journey from A to B for that particular uh, topic. Equally, we'll need to do that for other things as well uh, going forward. Okay, so the other thing that the borough strategy does talks around ways of working, and then they're not quite design principles, but they are really trying to set out about how we as a partnership want to work. So as we're starting to think about new things that we want to do, starting to really test ourselves about actually, it, is this really kind of uh, helping us to work out what are shared responsibilities and who has a role to contribute as part of what we want to do going forward? Is it really intelligence and evidence-led, what we're doing here? Um, is it really getting closer to communities? And there's a number of things on there which I think help us as kind of a, a guide. And I think this is important to see it as that and then see it as those kind of tests, if you like, uh, as we kind of start our initiatives, interventions, and ways of working going forward. Uh, how can a health and wellbeing board help? So I, I suppose the, the first thing I'll say is that uh, uh, if you can come to the summit on the 25th number, that'd be fantastic. Um, we've, we've also got um, a, a number of actions which are listed in the Doncaster Living Together Perspectives. I don't expect you to be able to see that on there. But actually against those eight priorities, we've set out some really key things that we want to do over the next kind of 10 years and actually actually starting to revisit and making sure that those things that we said we we're going to do we kind of make sure that we're on with and deliver and uh, we've got a plan for for those going forward but one of those is thinking about how a kind of well-being commission might work in the future and again is part of the borough strategy which i went through last time thinking about some of those essentials some of those things that are really important so things around income housing social isolation, all of those, that, mental health, all those things actually come into play and you've, you've spoken about that. But really starting to think about how do, we, how do we bring some of that together and how a commission could help us do that. Uh, and, and then finally, I suppose that the, you know, it, as the wellbeing strategy comes to its kind of expiration, the current one, thinking about what, what does a new one need to look like in the context of everything I've said today and making sure that it, it builds on some of those pressures and issues and, 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 and uh, uh, discussions around the health and care system more widely, how does that strategy kind of come into being, bearing in mind that as the kind of context. Uh, finally, I think there's something about the kind of journey really, and there's three things, and then again, I'm not sure you'll be able to see that, but really on the left-hand side is really about saying, well, actually we've, we've agreed a strategy, we've kind of had some inputs, there's been uh, various forms of engagement and consultation, various forms of plans and strategies that are fed into it, and we've agreed it. Fantastic. The middle bit is really thinking about, well, actually, there's, there's come some points around what does the what do we need to do about that? And part of that is the Team Nocturne Summit to kind of bring people together, say, how, how do we do this collectively together? What is really going to align with you and your organisation and bringing that together going forward? And then finally, on the right-hand side, is really talking about, well, okay, so what do we do then? What do we do differently as a result of this? Some of that's around configuring our partnership, is what I've, what I've said earlier. Some of that's around how we communicate. Some of that might be thinking about how we commission. Some of that might be about how do we 
change and align our investment activity. So it's kind of though that's the journey that I wanted to kind of present uh, to people as we're going forward, which is really about saying that we've agreed something. Now we need to work out how we then look at that over the next 10 years, because the borough strategy was really setting out a vision for 2030. So really about how do we align and configure ourselves to make sure we've got the best chance of delivering what we said we said we would do going forward. I know that's very quick. Hopefully that's a good update for people in terms of A, the borough strategy and its agreement, and B, some of those key things that are coming up and how we might use those to make sure that we deliver against what we've all agreed to do. Thank you very much, Chair. Thanks very much, Alan. Um, and it's good to see everything progressing so well that we have talked about before. Has anybody got any comment, any concerns? We're all just happy to support. And as you say, the next uh, opportunity is that Team Doncaster Summit, which hopefully most of us will be at. Okay, nothing for that. Thanks very much, Alan. So we'll move us on to item 11, which is local solutions for people and places. This is a presentation by Phil Holmes um, about where we are in terms of the locality working. What I would ask you to do while Phil's, Phil's talking is about how your organisation can feed into this. What, how do you want to be part of it? Um, to understand that this will obviously be informed by engagement and obviously you all have people that you engage with and, and the last issue is to endorse the use of non-recurrent better care fund monies to invest in preventative work in each of Doncaster's localities. Phil, this is going to take us up to 11, so I will stop us just before, if that's okay. So. I like a challenge, and I was, I was worried you were going to say what you should do while Phil's talking is your emails, but, <laughs> but, but you, you didn't say that, so that's good. Um, <clears throat> I've overreached because I've talked about people, places, and planet, <coughs> which links in with the, with the borough strategy. Um, um, approach um, and I was just going to unpick about kind of three things and I'll send this slideshow around apologies that it's um, that it's only just being tabled um, Alan mentioned locality plans I know there's a kind of a almost an eye rolling about plans because there's so many plans around um, but what we've been trying to do is work in a different way with with Doncaster people um, so we've been trying to think about Doncaster, which is, as people will know, geographically the largest metropolitan authority and really managing it in a one-size-fits-all way is, is not helpful in terms of the size and variation in Doncaster. So we've looked at how do we describe plans alongside local people and communities that express a more local sense of what they will want. And it's very much to use the cliche about being on a little bit of a journey um, and it's about writing a plan that doesn't put people off but actually they can see themselves in it and their lived experience in it but also for the truly committed at the back end of the plan a chance to look at some of the other strategies and say okay how's that investment helping my area how's that um, that policy helping me so it's about trying to put everything in one place for people and almost in a way get a bit more engagement with Doncaster people because we're supposed to be serving them rather than talking at them. I think that's the idea. Um, so I'll cover a, a question about that later, but the thing to be um, clear about is that we'll try and take those plans through some governance um, and in January and any organization in this room who wants to have dialogue with local people ought to be interested in um, contributing and being part of those plans because it's a way of amplifying your voice and your interactions with local people as well. So that's a bit of a strategic slide, more of an operational slide in relation to what we call the local solutions model. It's not rocket science, this stuff, but it's just a way of collaborating on a more geographical basis with Doncaster people that feels more joined up. It's the sort of stuff we've been talking about in health and care for years and years and years, and it's Doncaster's approach to doing that. So um, some of the stuff you'll see, they're almost in a way um, kind of links to things you'd have read about in our place plan going back a few, a few years now. But the idea of um, kind of the shared foundations around no wrong door, um, but also the idea about um, information and advice for, for communities, 
and the idea that we work across boundaries to see and solve issues rather than bouncing people around. Those are, those are all cliches, aren't there, in, in, the, in the way that we, we, we talk for years. Um, and it's about trying to make those things happen more meaningfully. Um, there's been a few different strands of this because it's not really a big bang because when you think about the, all the interactions with Doncaster people and families that we do in this room, in our organisations and, and also organisations outside the room, you can't just take it and produce a one-size-fits-all plan for it. So really the core of the work, actually the place where the work started, I think, to, to, to get a bit of traction it's been a kind of a think family approach coming through children and young people's colleagues, starting to bring that focus into community safety, recognizing that there are cohorts of young people and kind of family cohorts where there's a big overlap around um, how to support um, stronger families um, and how to engage with other organizations, for example, South Yorkshire Police and other, and other community organizations to ensure that that's done in a, in a joined up way. So some work that the, the colleague to my right has been leading on in the south of the borough and, and some thinking about how to extend that across the borough, especially connecting actually with some of our town centre issues, Doncaster town centre issues, where we have cohorts in relation to rough sleeping and homelessness um, and other aspects of antisocial behaviour and younger, younger people in some of those cohorts as well and the sense that lots of us are working hard in that space but we could be more joined up so that an opportunity to build the model into the center of, of the borough and also into other parts of the borough there's a really useful connection earlier about general practice and and uh, perhaps coincidentally primary care and adult social care are in the same bullet point here but i think there is a journey that we can describe around better community access for adult social care that we also need to describe around better primary care access. And it's not about two, maybe citadels, citadels was a provocative word, mm -hmm. but it's not about two empires. It's about um, groups of professional professions collaborating in the interests of local people um, and not just thinking about where particular funding streams come from, but how we, we work together and obviously lots to learn from our voluntary and community sector in that space. Um, from, a, from a member perspective, actually, the local solutions is often about environmental matters. When I say environmental, I mean clean, safe communities. Actually, from a health and wellbeing perspective, we know that most uh, um, outcomes that result improve people's health and wellbeing aren't about what social care provide or statutory health organizations provide they are about communities that people feel are accessible they're proud of they want to get out in so we should probably take an interest in that strand of locality working in this um, in this forum as well and the last slides i'm going to go through are in relation to an opportunity particularly around health and well-being for non-recurrent better care fund um, monies to pump prime some ways of working that maybe will set us in good stead. So, presses the clicker, nothing happens. Presses it again, something happens. So, um, I'll, I'll, I will rattle through these slides and I take no credit for their content. We'll send them around, um, we'll send them around later. But really, it's just good to have that kind of shared ambition from the council and, and the CCG to use this money constructively to invest in our communities. So an, so an overarching sense of, um, especially as we head into the kind of integrated care system age, um, an opportunity to say, right, let's be clear about what Doncaster's neighborhoods and communities need. How do, we, how do we pump prime that? But also how do we generate the way of working that will stand us in good stead going forward? Um, so some work that's happened in terms of engaging with um, kind of local partners and colleagues. You can't read that right-hand box, but it is an important box in terms of the pressure that the NHS is under in relation to being able to describe neighbourhood outcomes, but also connect those with wider pressures in the system. So primary care pressures and the opportunities around primary care networks are mentioned, but also say non-elective pressures in, in, in the acute hospital and the underlying point, if we can get greater community prevention and focus on, on avoiding emergency care issues, then we've got more headspace to do 
um, to do other other things. Um, so the, again, you've you've seen some of these lenses before, but the um, but the um, the focus really here is about starting well, living well, and aging well. The killer slide, killer, killer bullet point at the bottom, because you're saying he's talked about money. What's he saying? How much is it? It's about two million pounds set aside that we need to work out for our for our communities and that investment. Sorry, Phil, we're going to stop now. It's just coming up to 11. You can carry on afterwards, just that we're going to do the silence now. Is it 11 o'clock, Jonathan? So if we could all just stop. <coughs> now, OK, thank you, everybody, for observing that silence. And no doubt many of us thinking about people, um, family members, etc., and uh, all those people across Lancaster who gave their lives um, throughout the many wars. Uh, thank you. Sorry, Phil, and thank you for that. And we'll just hand over to you back to you now. Thank you. I was tearing through it as well, just thinking, I'd, can I get through the whole thing by 11? But I can probably, I'll slow down <coughs> slightly, but still, I won't, I won't dilly dally. So, so our overall approach in relation to using the Better Care Fund, um, non recurrent monies, um, is to um, work with what we describe as provider collaboratives and I've suggested in the last slide uh, maybe a discussion about how you, how you see as health and wellbeing board members provider collaboratives note the plural they're operating um, but also the, um, to support those provider collaboratives making the best use of that money for the, for the benefit of, of local people that being informed by appropriate kind of data and insights Um, it's helpful that we've got some good examples in Doncaster already of approaches to really get alongside local communities. You can't read the text there clearly. You'll know what well Doncaster is, but it's helpful that we've got that those opportunities to get alongside local communities and really make the best use of investments. Tension is probably the wrong word, but there's a little bit of, of attention in the approach that's worth thinking through between the idea of do we use money to build on assets in local communities and harness the great strength that we have for people to make things happen? Or do we focus on deficits around we really must address this health condition and here's the way we're going to do that? Clearly, we do need an outcome that results in addressing health conditions. But it's almost a way of working kind of conversation. That's why I kind of put the World Doncaster model up there, because it may be a way of working that does address health conditions without maybe that more traditional top-down approach of we're coming in to sort out obesity in your area, which which doesn't necessarily always land effectively. So um, the, 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 the kind of dynamic arrow really just paraphrases what, what's already been described in terms of using data and collaboration to achieve an impact and, um, and make sure we keep that under review. And I'll ask a question later about how the Health and Wellbeing Board might want to review that. Um, and, you know, some really positive work from colleagues to get us to this point. Now a window ahead of April next year to be clear about how we do use that money, how we allocate it. I've not mentioned that actually the magic word on this, the magic word actually is inequality. So although I talked about the, the, the two million, actually I think there's a significant focus around using this money to address health inequalities, which is central both to the ICS's stated vision, but also to the, the things that we've spoken about here. So. I think the overall context is mobilising provider collaboratives in our localities to work together differently and give us some traction in addressing inequalities using some of the kind of the stages described here around planning, kind of galvanising delivery and then and then getting on with it. So final slide, I've just um, probably just taken um, just some suggested questions, clearly it doesn't limit what you might want to ask about but question about locality plans and how you might want to participate as health and wellbeing board members, especially drawn attention actually to, again, some of the World Doncaster work in local communities that's been about getting alongside people to frame um, solutions in communities' own terms and some dates coming up in the diary in different parts of the, 
of the borough that health and wellbeing board members might want to think are quite fancy seeing what that's about because it's it, uh, people that have been to them so far have found them refreshing and constructive in they, they've, they've assumed that communities won't have solutions and been pleasantly surprised to see that with the right facilitation a lot of um, constructive actions are possible um, second prompt is around the local solutions model so that operational point so I described some of the dimensions around children's um, think family approach connections with homelessness, connections with, with adult social care, primary care and so on. It's whether there's anything that Health and Wellbeing Board members would see as dimensions that we need to emphasise, um, partnerships that you'd like to promote and, or maybe organisations that you'd feel like you want to be to, to see more involved. Uh, and then third point in relation to the Better Care Fund, the provider collaboratives and how really that's a, a jargony way of me saying how would you like to see local localities organize to and who should be in that tent in a way to make sure that we make best use of the of the funding opportunity and just the general point about how you'd want to be appraised so that that's those are just prompts chair but you know obviously not exhaustive okay thanks very much phil um we've got lucy kath uh anybody else wanting to answer any of these questions Stop. I imagine Kath and I are going to ask exactly the same question. Um, so in terms of the, um, the provider collaboratives, um, I know that members of the Health and Social Care Forum will want to be part of that. We're all delivering within communities, have been doing for a number of years. Um, the voluntary and community sector at the moment, there is huge competition for funding, um, enormous challenges at the moment. Um, being able to work with local communities using some of this funding would be really essential so just a very practical thing that looks quite a short turnaround so you're talking about January February the collaboratives coming together and then March it being implemented could you sort of describe a little bit more about that and how we might get involved I'd probably describe it by um, asking Anthony and Rupert to describe it um, because because I think that's the that that, that I've, I've kind of nicked some of those latter slides are a bit nicked and I think it's just using this to ask those questions. I, I thought that might be coming my way. <laughs> so so um, really, committed to, really committed to this approach. I think um, what I was going to say, um, Chair, was if COVID, the response to the pandemic taught me anything, it was the way that organisations rallied around each other on a locality basis and the impact that that made um, to, to, to the residents within those boroughs. So as well as the examples that Phil has, has given, we've got a real life example that we've been living now and now is the time to, 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 em, to embrace that. There's a genuine commitment to this from a commissioning perspective that's shown by resource, but also in the change of the approach that we want to take by, I'll use the word provide collaboratives, but putting them at the forefront of, of, of working this together. So I'm teeing you up here, Cap. But in answer to, in answer to the question of, of how, what, what next, it's about using the forums that we've got already. Um, so we do, have, we do have forums where providers come together, uh, uh, as you know, but bringing them together to, and with some of the other organisations to actually, to actually drive on this. Because a big risk to this, if I'm honest, is that Richard's staff, I think Christina's staff, a lot of those big organisations, they're really in the response phase still, as, as what's described. So I think putting the organisations such as the voluntary, the community and the faith sector at the forefront of this, the primary care networks uh, and, and the federation um, to drive these action plans. So I think it's, just, it's a case of getting the nuts and bolts on how that's going to happen, Lucy. Thanks, Anthony. Um, Kath, did you want to come in as well? And then Jackie. Yeah, I mean, I think um, <clears throat> in terms of just going back a step in, t in terms of the asset and deficit model, equalities has got to be there, obviously. So there might be a bit of both um, because it, th there is an awful lot of levelling up and trying to... Well, some of the, the sort of differences in the, that map that you said the, are there for a legitimate reason, and that's, that's but it's understanding that. But where there isn't sort of consistency in approach that's what we need to be trying to get to so every resident in Doncaster can access in the same way and have equal access to whatever services they need um, what I would also like to say is that in terms of the um, the presentations I've heard today all of them 
looking at individuals, the, the common issue, whether it's young children, um, adults or health related questions, they live somewhere and, and, and there is a community provision somewhere to support them, whatever the, the issue is. So we need to turn things around a bit and rather than looking at the system, what can, the system can do, look at what are the experiences of those individuals and what are their natural journeys where would they encounter or be informed about and bring it up from the, the grassroots literally and just turn things on the head a little. So I think there's an awful lot we can do and the point about um, the competition in terms of the sector, that's the way the system drives it. You know, you bid for money and therefore you're pitching all the voluntary sector against each other. They don't share ideas because they don't want their idea to be pinched and therefore somebody else to be able to craft a better bid to get the money. So we just really do need a total rethink in terms of the way that we, we approach this kind of transformation, because it is going to be transformational. And one, I was thinking when also earlier, sorry for rambling, um, but in terms of the, the mission and vision for, for Voluntary Action Doncaster, we have in there trying to address and improve the health, happiness and wealth of everybody in Doncaster. And so how do we measure those things? And that happiness sort of issue is something that is really intangible and we won't directly on our own turn those sort of themes around, but we know that we can contribute. Um, and it's not necessarily about saying, oh, well, I only contributed 25% to that. that. Because we're all one team and that's what we need to, to move towards. Thanks very much, Kath. And I'm gonna take the last question of Jackie and then I'm gonna to have to move us on. Thank you. Um, it was uh, in response, really, to Lucy, and, and I think you asked a really practical question about how, and actually, uh, on what a provider collaborative means, and actually there is one in Doncaster already. At the moment, it tends to be made up of statutory organisations, um, and so that includes colleagues like Richard and, and DBH and Ardash, and um, uh, we've got... Um, St Ledger etc on there we, we need to broaden that out we need voluntary sector sat around the table and I know we're having those conversations and actually we have some services so, so the NA, so, so we're, we have been set up to compete against each other but the whole ambition of that collaborative is actually everyone sits in the room together and says what resource have we got and how we're going to use it wisely and, and make those decisions together as providers who used to compete and actually there's a real role for, for, for voluntary sector in there and, um, and that's why we want to focus this on voluntary sector. I think that's why it would land voluntary sector and sort of primary care that Dean was talking about earlier. But it could sit under that umbrella and then you get involved in those broader conversations as well. So, so the infrastructure's there, so let's use it is what I would say. Okay, thanks very much. Sorry. Sorry, Chair. There is, just following on from Jackie's point, I think the challenge will be the language and the understanding of the language to all elements of the sector because provide a collaborative in that sense is understood potentially in this room about localities but we've got provided collaboratives running at system level you know across the whole of South Yorkshire and Basel or we've got you know provided collaboratives at place well provided localities at, but we need to be really really clear in the architecture that we're designing from the 1st of April what the language is so that everybody knows what it is we're trying to achieve because you know I took this as being that we would have a locality based model that would provide services that are based upon the need of that locality which might not be the same as the one next door and we'll work together to try to make sure that that locality gets what it needs to move forward at its simplest level provided collaboratives i think will just go over people's heads communities heads and we need to get the language right because it meant something very different to me when phil first put it up about provided collaboratives and what my part in that was going to be Thanks very much, Richard. I'm getting the feeling here that we, we perhaps need a much bigger discussion that people are involved in to address Richard's point and understand next steps. Does that make sense? Apologies if that is already happening, um, but I'm not getting a feeling that perhaps it is. Phil, do you want to come back? I, this is going to be the last point because I am going to have to move us on, so if we can round up on next steps, that would be really useful. Yes, um, timing is urgent as as as, as was stated, personally, I think we, we're talking about yeah, provider collaborative is, a, is jargon that is used in different bits of the system and can mean different things to different people. I think we're looking for conversations for people to join up at locality level using that budgetary envelope. And it's about being clear from a commissioning perspective about that process as soon as possible 
whether you know and i think that's a really key action that hopefully will come out of this meeting because we've got infrastructure but there isn't a connection between that infrastructure and this approach at the moment that we've articulated so we just need to do that okay so there will after this there will be meetings arranged people can go along to give their ideas say how they want to be involved is that what i'm hearing yeah Sorry, are people happy with that then, that it's another conversation, not a meeting, but it's conversations to see how we can all join in and be part of the locality model? Because I think it's unusual that if we're going to commit as a board to supporting to use that money, then the money is there. Normally we're having to make decisions without... Point to Jackie and... Sorry, last point. I mean, the work is moving forward and under the sort of partnership board arrangements in Doncaster, we, we have agreed that those conversations will take pay, place um, and we, it will bring together sort of the primary care and voluntary sector. So plans are in place to have those conversations just so that you're aware of that and you've got some sort of confidence around that. Okay, just to say then to finish, to ask, answer your last question, I'd like to see this come back to the next board meeting if we can. Um... And is that possible that we can bring it back in January? Um, it is January, yeah, because that would be really useful to see about progress. And obviously, if we're talking about an April implementation, if there are partners that are perhaps not as engaged as they want to be, this bringing it to this board might be the opportunity to get that drive. Is that okay? Okay, everybody. Um, so we're all asked. We're all. I'm not seeing any disagreement in terms of use of non-recurrent funding. And obviously organisations have got the offer there from Phil in terms of being involved. And as Jackie said, meetings are taking place. As usual, I've been a rubbish chair because I get too engrossed in the agenda. I just need to chair it clinically next time. So we are going to have to run on to about quarter to 12, so I hope that's not a problem. Um, and I'm going to hand over now to Vicky, who, Victoria, sorry, who is going to give us an update on history, health and happiness and well-being at Heritage Doncaster and I think given the themes that we've discussed today the different ways that we can improve well-being it's so important that everybody's bought into this Lucy's talked about arts etc but and heritage is perhaps something we've not had that much on about before so really interested to hear an update thank you so we'll see how much of my, this my voice gets through so uh, I might have to do some bit through interpretive dance if we get to that point um, so, I'm hoping today to do three things. Um, to introduce you to History, Health and Happiness um, with the intention of looking for your feedback and critique. Um, be nice though, please. Um, and then we're also looking at um, informing some future funding applications. Uh, and I'll explain how our programme is funded and kind of what the implications of that are. Um, but originally when the programme was conceived, it was built on the previous JSNA and the, the, the picture of Doncaster has changed quite a lot in that time. So we're looking at how, um, in future funding applications, what we might include in there um, to improve health and well-being um, now. And then I'm also, there's kind of some specific questions around um, things we could be doing in our current programme. This is all repeated on the last slide, so there's, you don't have to remember all of this. Um, so just to introduce you, for those that don't know, um, Heritage Doncaster is the local authority funded heritage organisations um, in Doncaster. So that's um, the museum we're right next door to now, um, a regimental museum, Cusworth Hall and Park and the local studies and archives. And we look after around a million objects and specimens um, that span the histories of millions of years. Uh, History, Health and Happiness, though, is um, a programme of work that takes place outside of those spaces. It takes place in localities around the borough with the intention of um, using history and storytelling to spark conversation, improve well-being and tackle isolation. So really simply put, we use history to enable people to feel good about themselves and their communities. We work with a combination of people. So we work with vulnerable and isolated adults, families and young people. And our sessions are delivered both in collaboration with other third sector organisations and independently. Um, as I've said, they all take place outside of the museum. So what that means in practical terms is we, our work is delivered in libraries, community halls, parks, family hubs, graveyards, anywhere that will have us really. And we're really keen to anchor ourselves as being part of Doncaster's communities. And all of our work is evaluated um, by Sheffield Hallam University and ARC Research. 
Um, all of our sessions have co-production at the heart, so the sessions that take place in Balby look really different to the sessions that take place in Mexborough. They're not comparable. So um, we focus really on three main types of activity. Um, our activities began in earnest in April, um, sorry, in August of 2019 after a period of consultation. So the activities we focus on, um, the first are social clubs and outreach activities, and there were loads of examples of these circulated in advance, um, but they include things like Her Story, which is a weekly social club for women in Denaby, Maine, where we explore the stories of women in the past. Um, we've also, we also deliver ESOL learning through cooking historical recipes, and we run imagination workshops with young carers. Partnerships are also a really big part of what we do. Um, we partner with other organisations within the third sector, council teams and other MPOs like DARTS, um, to deliver partnership-based work, um, which enables us to share our resource um, really crucially. We're only a team of two, um, so we have a lot to do, um, so we do that really effectively by partnership. And thirdly, we also support community exhibitions um, and we programme our moving museum, which is our travelling museum. Uh, so during the pandemic, we had to, like everyone else, adapt what we were doing. Um, and I'm quite confident in saying that History, Health and Happiness was really part of a support network for many of our participants. We delivered a suite of activities because we were really aware that we had to play a role in continuing to support the most vulnerable people that access our services. Um, and we also were getting more and more referrals on a daily basis as people were, were feeling lonely for the first time. We also work really closely with um, charities who were struggling, and we wanted to find ways to, to support them as well. So what we did is a, a series of online and offline activities, again, being quite mindful of digital poverty. Uh, we did a, a bit of an audit of our participants, and less than 30% had regular access to the internet, so we couldn't just fall back on online services. So what we did do online is launch some digital social clubs, um, people getting together online to... Um, some of them for the very first time using their computers in that way. Those clubs are still running now, so they're still remaining relevant to people's lives. Um, but we also looked at offline activity. So we ran an activity pack program where once a month we sent out activity packs based on our collections. Um, at the beginning of the pandemic, we were sending out 200 a month to individual people. By the end, that's around 800. Um, and all of that was done from my front room. So you can imagine what my house looked like. <laughs> Um, we also looked at ways we could support our partner organisations. So uh, where organisations were running telephone socials, we joined in, we provided alternative content. Uh, content. Um, there was, there's lots of videos of me talking on the internet about various bits of history to try and provide some entertainment. Um, this work, really crucially, was has been recognised for a series of awards. Um, we've been recognised for a Community Impact Award at the Museums and Heritage Awards and just recently um, I was nominated for an award with the Museums Association as well. So I talked about how this work is all um, evaluated to make sure that we, we are able to confidently claim that we're really making a difference. Um, our first impact report was released um, in, in 2019. Um, and the headline stats are, are all in the documents I've sent through, so I'm not going to go through them in detail. But essentially, what we were able to find is that people were meeting new people. So 93% of people that came to our programs met someone new. Um, and there was a 20% increase in feelings of interest in other people. And also a rise in the feelings of belonging and connectedness. We also repeated this, these kind of evaluation studies um, last year. And the data was much harder to interpret, um, given the impact of COVID on mental health. It put, it put all the stats out of whack, really. But what the evaluators were able to claim is that our online sessions especially reached out to the vulnerable and built online communities. The evaluation concluded that for those who attended, the impact was considerable, both in terms of connection, mental health, and increased confidence around computer use. We're enabling people to make new friends, develop skills, and improve their well-being. Um, digital social club attendees have a 20% increase in the interest of new things, a key marker in increased mental health scores. So the data is all there. The data is there nationally, and we've also then compiled this kind of local data study of the role that heritage can play in well-being. Um, the stats are brilliant, but there's also really lovely kind of personal stories. Um, again, this is all in the documentation I've sent out before, but um, one of the case studies is about a lady called Marie. 
And when Marie came to us, um, she, was, um, she was shielding. She had had a period of time where she's seen absolutely nobody. And the really nice thing that I like in her, in her kind of testimony there, is she describes our social clubs as the way that she got her sparkle back. Um, so regardless of everything else, it's a win, if it was, even if it was just her. So as I said, we have a reputation for best practice within the cultural sector. So you in this room may never have heard of us, um, but there are people in Glasgow that um, I was asked to speak, speak at a conference last week because of um, the work we're doing within the museum sector. So within the museum sector, our work is often cited as best practice. We're featured in blogs, on social media, at conferences. We're nominated for all of those good awards. And my real challenge is to bring the reputation of our programme up within the council and within Doncaster. Um, so I'm really interested in ways that we can explore that um, in this room. Um, it's great that other museums think we're brilliant, but we need more of that here. Um, so when it comes to what next, so we are um, looking at a blended approach to our activities, not a bended approach, I'm not sure what that is. Um, and we're looking, so we are offering digital and in-person going forward. In terms of how our funding works, so we are funded at the moment by Arts Council England, and we will find out next month whether we have an extension year, and then we will then be reapplying to Arts Council after that. I'm also though exploring other avenues of funding. Last year we received our first commission, so we were directly commissioned by Doncaster Mind to deliver activities, and I'm interested in exploring what else we might do with that. So um, in terms of kind of some questions that I have, or some kind of advice really, so, as I've said, I'm looking at building and enhancing the reputation of the programme. It's really strong in the cultural sector, within the museums, but not so strong here. So how, how can I do that? Who else should I be talking to? When it comes to looking at our future funding applications, what other role could history, health and happiness play in Doncaster in the future? So we use our history and our storytelling really creatively. It's not just about sessions that you would have had at school. Um, it's, it's not just about dry here's an object, let me tell you all about it. We, we bring history to life. Um, many people that come to our sessions say that they hated history at school um, and they never thought it could be something that's interesting. And we're hoping to, to readdress that balance. I think Lucy can testify that we do that. <laughs> um, and then I'm also looking at then the areas of development in the time that we, uh, we can guarantee we have left beyond that kind of additional funding. Um, we have began some work with children and young people, so we work, we work quite closely with young carers at the moment. We're looking at expanding that. And then there's other, so I said our work is all localities based. Um, we've had really big successes in Denneby and in Mexborough, but we're finding it much harder in Stainforth, Adwick, Woodlands and Hexthorpe. So we're looking at avenues there. Um, we, as I said, we have one commission from, from Doncaster Mind with, for adult mental health, but we're looking at enhancing that. And then we're quite keen to look at co-production from other elements. So we, we co-produce really effectively with our participants. They really drive the content and the structure of our sessions. Um, but I think for, for kind of one of the ways to get more buy-in for us is to look at how we could co-produce with health professionals as well. Um, so they are my questions, and my voice survived, so I'm ready for some questions. <laughs> Do you want to leave the questions on? Do you want to leave the questions oh, on? If I can work it out. And there we go. I can address them. Thank you very much for that, and uh, to hear that somebody got their sparkle back, I think we often underestimate those comments, don't we? And I think we often end, underestimate the importance of friendship, and picking up Lee's presentation earlier. They're often the fundamentals that if they're not there, then people do develop, um, their well-being is severely affected, so thank you for that. Brilliant to hear as well about the awards, but obviously we've got to get it right in Doncaster now. So interested to hear from colleagues about how we can help make sure everybody knows about this brilliant service. So I've seen lots of hands. I saw Sarah first, Christina, Ruth. I've not got a badge, you say, for me to read. <laughs> uh, that right, we'll go then. So over to Sarah first. Thank you so much for uh, that brilliant presentation. Um, I'm. I'm a healthcare professional and an artist, so I work in both of those areas. And I'm counsellor of Adwick and Carcraft with Woodlands. And actually, um, I would love the opportunity to link with you because history, I would say my area is obsessed with history. Yeah. 
So it's a fantastic way to be able to actually build that engagement and we're wanting to create like a heritage a museum and obviously one area is specifically a conservation area uh, which I'm really 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 wanting to use creative practice to explore that um, and I think that's going to be a really good way to sort of build this up and um, that yeah museums aren't just in a museum um, yeah so it's a brilliant way uh, and we just wanted to offer um, help and connection there. Thanks very much, Christina. Yeah, I just wanted to say that um, I live in the 19s and your last question, how can we uh, co-produce with health professions? I would love to, to do that, so I think we probably just need a, uh, a conversation. I, I don't know how, but I think as soon as we got together and had a conversation, I think we would be able to do that. So um, you've certainly got my uh, vote and, and buy-in. Yeah, Victoria, apologies. I'm one of the uh, people who haven't heard of, of the services currently, so you know, great and wonderful to hear. Um, it's about connections, I think, um, and how we maybe connect the work that you're doing in with some of, the, some of the other work that's happening, particularly I was thinking of Stainforth um, and some of the work that's happened, happened there. Um, I suppose I'm just interested, um, a question I'm interested to hear, how people, how do people currently find their way through to, to the sessions? And can we build on that? Um, or do we need to think of alternative Routes and sign of ways of signposting and connecting, I suppose. Yeah, so oh, I'm not used to this on off business. Um, so, the way people find us at the moment is, is really um, lots of different ways, essentially. Our biggest sort of seller is through word of mouth. Um, we spend a lot of time kind of beating the pavements in these areas. So, um, we, so for, we, I've just employed someone specifically to do work in Stainforth because it was one of our hardest areas. So 90% of her job is having cups of tea in, in spaces in Stainforth, being that voice on the ground. Um, we do receive referrals through social prescribing. Um, so during the pandemic, that was huge, absolutely huge. Interestingly though, um, basically 95% of those referrals are people that don't want to come to physical activity. Um, they're looking at postal activities, and at the moment we're still offering those postal activities. So I'm interested to see how that will drop off when eventually we have to phase out sending millions of things out from my front room. Um, and then through, there's also people then referred in through Doncaster Mind, Befriend, Alzheimer's Society, all those kind of organisations. Um, there's less referrals that come through um, through kind of other kind of statutory service, I guess. Thanks, Richard. Yeah, just, just in respect of who else to talk to, I mean, clearly we've got a significant comms team who talk to lots of people via different media. Um, and obviously we have quite a lot of children and their families pass through our services, you know, outpatients and inpatients. So probably talk to our comms team. We've also got an archivist, which you, know, you, you may know about. And he, in essence, documents the history of the hospitals. He's got loads of artifacts and other stuff and it was you know talking to him about what he does with it and how he uses it and displays it because he basically sits in a you know a room that he's got <laughs> he's the only person that ever sort of sees it except when he produced a lovely book about the history of Doncaster hospitals so, <coughs> so if you don't already talk to him because it'd be great if he could you know use some of his history of the hospitals you know for the local communities on you know because it's really interesting Thanks very, thanks very much, Richard. So, some offers there in terms of who to speak to. Well, I think we've addressed in terms of commissioning. What would commissioning look like? Is that a conversation, I think, outside of this meeting? Um, but I think Victoria needs to be connected. I can see Anthony nodding, so... And I've got Kath and Jackie first. Um, just thinking and reflecting on some of the things that have been said. I mean, I always think that this area is, is great um, for intergenerational work um, and storytelling. I mean, my, my family, mine is from Woodlands and Adwick, so yeah, I, I kind of connect with that. In, in, but that generation have, have all disappeared now. So how can you sort of like share that history? Um, so working with some of the people that are still around, that intergenerational work would be great. Um, I'm happy to help wherever we can. Thanks, Kath. And Jackie, the last comment. 
Thanks. Uh, um, so there's lots of opportunities, I think. But one that really just stands out is that I'm the transforming care lead for South Yorkshire. And um, around that sort of um, LD, um, uh, you know, sort of but severe LD and, and maybe some... And, and so I'd, I'd welcome a conversation or put you in touch with the individual who leads that piece of work for me. Okay, thank you ever so much. Hopefully you've got some leads there. Um, and it'd be great to hear in, a, in, in perhaps a six months time at the board about how those leads have developed and what's happened. What I will do is have a conversation with Nigel in terms of whether we've done a members seminar on this so you can start to engage members. Perhaps it might be better to do it through the locality model, but we'll have those discussions outside the meeting. So if people can give some more thought to those questions and get back to to Victoria, that would be great. But thank you very much and, and keep on with the brilliant work. Okay then, so on to item 11, which is the Better Care Fund, and this is the last item from Rupert. Yeah, thanks, uh, Rachel. So uh, I was gonna say from the sublime to the, the ridiculous, um, in that uh, there are very few things that the Health and Wellbeing Board has to do. The Joint um, Strategic Needs Assessment is one, the Health and Wellbeing Strategy is another. Um, over the years, the sign-off of the Better Care Fund plan has defaulted to the Health and Wellbeing Board to be the uh, signatory. Uh, what you've got is the plan for 21-22. So, um, yes, we're halfway through the year already. Guidance came out in September, uh, just at the end of September, for a November sign-off. So, um, might not be surprising that the majority of uh, schemes that are in the plan are a rollover because they were all, they've already been operating for the first six months of the year. However, there are a couple of things to note. So there are some new national conditions and some new national metrics, and they're in sort of paragraph 5.2 and 5.3. And an area that we are expecting quite a lot of scrutiny on is length of stay. So in the metrics, particularly uh, uh, interest from NHS colleagues, about people who are staying longer than 14 days and longer than 21 days uh, in hospital. That's not been um, so significant in previous Better Care Fund plans, but given the conversation we had earlier with Richard about how busy the hospital is, it's not surprising that that has uh, gone up in uh, the agenda. So there are um, a couple of things that we need to do on that. Um, we've had um, some national feedback in the last uh, 24 hours that we need to strengthen that section, make sure our data is correct, and make sure our narrative and the things that we're putting in place um, support that. And that's across hospital, um, social care, and other elements of the health and wellbeing uh, board. In terms of the sort of sign off and the submission process, uh, it needs to be submitted by the 16th of November. In previous uh, years, if the board's not had the final version, and this obviously isn't the final version given that we need to make those amendments, we've usually delegated the uh, sign-off to Director of Public Health, Director of Social Care, and the uh, Chief Operating Officer of the CCG to do in consultation with the Chair. We uh, we propose to do the same uh, this year. The uh, one area that most um, places have a challenge with is something called a Section 75 agreement, which is a legal agreement about how money moves around the system. Um, we already have a Section 75 in Doncaster, and I don't expect that to be a major challenge. I think our key over the next you know, 24, 48 hours is to make sure that uh, that um, section, particularly around the length of stay, uh, is um, uh, effective and that we can uh, describe our story of what we know is happening on the ground now, um, that, that we can describe that in a way that uh, allows us to submit the bid. So that's all I wanted to say on that. I don't know, Phil, if you wanted to say anything else on, on that. Uh, Nobody wanting to comment, commissioners? No? Oh, and Yeah, just, um, I think we can do that, can't we? And get and get that sound off, because as we have we know, there's a lot of work going on in, in, in that area, and I think it's just a case of um, articulating that. This is, you, you know, we're in November and we're signing off 21-22 here. Um, I think it probably is just worth saying that we're very co very committed to continuing this approach um, g going forward. Our joint commissioning arrangements with the local authority, our locality approach, um, the areas of opportunity in there. Clearly that might be muddied a little bit 
by the changes to the to to the uh, um, for movement from the CCG to the integrated care system, but we've already flagged our intention that this sort of, this would uh, negate over to that um, come the uh, come the start of April. So, what that will look like, Rupert, I'm not sure yet, but um, just to signal the continued <coughs> commitment to this. Thanks very much. Um, I, don't, I think I've been doing this role four years, and I don't think we've ever had it before September, have we? This so. Perhaps somebody could have a word with whichever department it is and ask them to hurry it along so we can actually plan. But anyway, that would be nice. So are we all, we've all got to, um, there's no comments, no further questions. We're happy that it's been delegated in terms of the sign-off because we obviously can't see the final plan. We've got to address the section on 14 to 21 days. Luckily, we've got the section 75 um, and then we will review it at a future wellbeing board. So that brings us to the end of the agenda. Thank you so much for all your input. I think it's been, as usual, a really interesting meeting. We've learned a lot. We've got lots of further challenges. Um, but the fact that we are all wanting to work together on the same journey, I think will make a huge difference. I think this is going to happen really quickly, this photograph. I'm looking at Louise. So I think if you could just got one minute and if you bring Teresa in, we will get that done straight away people that need to sign the charter if you're not on the board just stay for the photograph anyway that's absolutely fine so uh wishing everybody well um we don't meet again do we until so i wish you all a very happy christmas and i might be the first person to do it so thank you very much <laughs>